I'm delighted to welcome you to this academic symposium in celebration of Professor David Dunger. I'm Professor Ken Ong, and David was my PhD and clinical supervisor, and then colleague, mentor, and friend for 25 years. We have a great agenda ahead for the day. Uh, I have to say it was a challenge to produce a succinct uh, agenda, such was the breadth of David's research interests and collaborations. We could have gone on for a couple of days. But let me point you to another recent presentation that we put together in celebration of David receiving the Diabetes UK Robert Turner Award. The agenda of that celebration includes a number of presentations from investigators in the Department of Paediatrics in Cambridge and also a fantastic compilation of presentations from wider collaborators, friends and family, as well as some very warm and moving words by Jane Roberts, David's wife. And you can find uh, the recording of that event on the Department of Paediatrics website um, from the home page under events or news. And so I see today's agenda as a continuation or second part of that earlier celebration. And still there are many others uh, that, that I could have included. But these talks under the headings of type 1 diabetes, endocrinology, and population studies are meant to illustrate the breadth of David's research interests. Now in choosing between a face-to-face -face meeting or a totally online meeting, hybrid meetings are the most challenging and so let me apologize in advance for any technical glitches. But it means that among the 15 to 20 people in this seminar room. I'm delighted that uh, David's wife, Jane, has joined us. And his son, Jack, will also attend in person this afternoon. Hello, I am Professor David Rowich, Head of Pediatrics at the University of Cambridge, and sorry that I'm unable to attend in person today. We are here to celebrate David Dunger, F. Med Sai, Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics at the University of Cambridge, who passed away on 20th July, 2021. David received training in pediatric endocrinology at the Hospital for Sick Children, Great Ormond Street. Between 1986 and 2000, he was consultant pediatric endocrinologist and later professor of pediatric endocrinology at the John Radcliffe Hospital, University of Oxford. In 2000, he moved to Addenbrooke's Hospital, the University of Cambridge, to take up a chair in pediatrics. David was internationally renowned for his research into the pathophysiology of type 1 diabetes and its complications in children and young people. His studies of genetic and environmental interactions during childhood growth have helped in determining risk for type 2 diabetes. He published over 600 peer-reviewed papers and led major international research consortia. Professor Dunger was a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and recipient of numerous awards, including the Andrea Prater Prize from the European Society for Pediatric Endocrinology, the James Spence Prize from the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, the James Tanner Award from the Pediatric Society of Pediatric Endocrinology, and the International Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes Prize of Achievement. We will hear today from investigators and international leaders in pediatric endocrinology and type 1 diabetes research that will highlight new approaches and the prospect of transformative therapies, including immunotherapy, devices, cell-based therapy, and precision medicine for children and young people living with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. I would like to thank you for your participation in this event. I trust we will come away with a renewed sense for progress in the field and David Dunger's many vital contributions. And now I'll hand off to organizer, Professor Ken Ong. 
So um, I'm really pleased that uh, Jane Roberts, uh, David's wife, can join us today. Many of us, uh, well, who knew David worked almost every hour of the day, you know, evenings, uh, every weekend, and uh, I guess many, many of us feared he really didn't have any sort of life outside of uh, medicine. So we were really <laughs> delighted to get to meet Jane and his family, it is, uh, his children and, uh, uh, and, and, and grandchildren, and uh, you know, realize what a wonderful and rich life you know, he, he had also outside of, uh, outside of medicine. I should have said, I, as a PhD student, he would often drop uh, manuscripts you know, through my door at home at the weekend. Um, and then uh, that role was taken up by Angie Watts in, in, in Oxford and, uh, and then in, in Cambridge by Jane Horsford, <laughs> David's, uh, uh, David's secretary. So it really did seem that, uh, uh, that, that David was uh, working every hour of the day, but it's been uh, yeah, wonderful to, to, to get to know Jane and, and uh, look forward to her presentation. I've got Thanks some so slides so here. Do I need to stand where you are? Yes, if that's okay, then they can okay. see you and there's and some in terms of the slides there's a button down here or the yeah or with the mouse okay the mouse. fantastic thank you very much actually that's what david would have said wouldn't he fantastic <laughs> <laughs> i just realized actually i did i did uh print out some of what i was going to say i might not stick to it but then i realized when i printed it um, I printed it on, and you will recognise that writing. Uh, and I thought how yeah. how oh. apposite that was. So I thought I would I would bring that. <laughs> uh, we have many of those intricate pieces of paper with wraps and arrows, and uh, that I've kept. Okay. Um, so first of all, I just want to say a big thank you to uh, Cambridge University Department of Pediatrics, uh, to David David Rowich, and to uh, Ken for hosting this celebration of David's academic contribution. Uh, Daisy and Jack, David's children, Peter, his brother, who I know is online, I think Jack is too, the moment, uh, we're all immensely grateful for you for doing this. It, it means a great deal for us. I can hardly quite believe that it's um, nearly a year now since David died. It both feels very long and very short. Uh, I occasionally would ask David, had he thought about a fest shrift at some point? And he would kind of mutter a bit um, to show that it was sort of vaguely, vaguely in his mind, but he kind of pushed it to, to the back of his mind because I think for him that very much signified a closing of a door, a closing of a door that he resolutely wanted to keep open. Uh, it was too much, I think, for him. Uh, he never wanted to, to retire, and you, you will know that. There was simply too much for him to do to pursue his research goals. And the truth is, he just loved it. He really loved it. I mean, it is true, he did work all the time, but he, it was with great pleasure that he did that, and he really enjoyed it. Occasionally, he would tell me that he'd be, and uh, he'd be content to draw, because uh, he had a considerable talent for drawing, I don't know how quietly he kept that, but he had a considerable talent for drawing. Uh, he'd be content to draw in the sun in Umbria, in Italy. And I have to say, I was highly sceptical and wholly unconvinced that that was the case. Mm -hmm. And as distressing as I found David's very rapid decline last year, over about six weeks or so, uh, I take great comfort in knowing that actually that's what he would have wanted and that he could have worked and he did work until uh, very close to the end of his life. That was really important to him. And I do take great comfort from that. Although perhaps David might have thought again about having uh, to have a fesh rift, had he known that instead of him uh, perhaps talking, it would be me talking here in his stead. <laughs> uh, and he has no redress, no comeback, as you will see, uh, at all. Because he was, uh, he was a very private man. Uh, who kept his personal life, we heard, very, very separate from his work. He did have an unnerving capacity to compartmentalise. Although, I was saying to Nick Wareham, he did tell me quite a lot about all of you. <laughs> <laughs> but you needn't worry too much, I'm a psychiatrist, so I'm used to keeping stum. <laughs> uh, now, I uh, had, have, I don't know, I, I'd known David for a very, very long time. 
uh, initially since we worked together uh, in a neonatal unit uh, at the then very Republican London Hospital uh, many, many moons ago. I don't think either of us are, were very doctorly doctors, but even then as a lowly SHO, I was very quickly struck simply by how good a doctor David was in all its facets, and I emphasize that. David was a really astute diagnostician. I remember you know, I was a baby SHO being deeply impressed by his clinical diagnosis very rapidly of a baby born at Bart's uh, with, with listeria, enabling really quick and effective, well, very quick treatment as effective as it possibly could be. I was deeply impressed by that. Um, and his thoughtful, critical and rigorous thinking, even then in his approach to treatment of the babies. But I think that was for me, what really was a kind of hallmark of him throughout his life. He had a really interesting, different way of thinking, critical, rigorous, and really, really interesting. Um, really, really interesting. And he had a lovely, lovely gentle manner uh, with the babies and their parents. This is all a long time ago. I have to say that the nurses adored him on the unit. <laughs> now, it, it took me a good while longer, I have to tell you. Uh, we married in 2005, albeit when our son was a teenager. Um, from Great Ormond Street, uh, where it was Professors Mike Priest and Otto Wolf, who were really key influences on David, often talked about them, and, and we know Mike and Jan. Well, David went on to Oxford, uh, initially as consultant, and you'll hear from colleagues there, not just to paediatrics, but to punts, picnics, and dog racing. Julie Edge and, and colleagues might say more about that later. Uh, but then, of course, in 2000, he came to Cambridge, and, um, and soon he and some colleagues from Oxford were all about working here together in Cambridge. So Carlo, Carlo Acciarini, uh, Ken, now Professor Ken Ong, uh, Lynn Ahmed, Andrew Watts, and Theresa Bahu. Carlo and David uh, may have heard shared an office together here, here in Addenbrookes. Uh, and David would often talk about how they would happily swear together in the morning at uh, the latest Tory outrage. I mean, David would have had a field day at the moment. Well, we'll be both here. absolute field day at the moment <laughs> over uh, improbably strong, and certainly in David's cases, uh, horribly sweet espressos. Mm -hmm. To say David was absolutely devastated by Carlo's death three years ago, absolutely devastated. But Cambridge was so very, very good for, uh, for, for David and, and for us, actually. Um, and I think David for Cambridge, you will know, I don't need to tell you, highly, highly productive time, both clinically and academically. David always seemed to have a grant application on the go, and you know, there you had sort of piles of grant applications that accompanied him and us on holiday, together with an odd MD thesis or two, wherever we went. I mean, really, uh, I know that because I typed some of them uh, <laughs> on, ho on, on holiday, Jane. Because <laughs> uh, he conveniently never, uh, never mastered the art of speed typing. Uh, <laughs> So they're, 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 there they all were, but they, they were productive here. He pulled in serious money uh, for research uh, together with his research team in Cambridge and together with colleagues uh, elsewhere in the UK and abroad, mainland Europe, Belgium, Italy, Switzerland, his very good friend, Primus Mullis, uh, Australia, South Africa. And you, know, you were his work family, loyal and immensely, immensely important to him. So some really serious work but always, of course, with a sense of mischief. Uh, he and Angie, you've heard, would sort of sneak out here to the playing fields. I think that's now been banned, hasn't it? There's some way in which <laughs> absolutely <laughs> to, uh, to smoke their uh, so-called so field trips. And very sadly, Angie died uh, after David, but in the last year also. Important too, it's really important to say, is David's determination to nurture young academic talent. That was really important to him, the PhD programme here, and more, more generally. He lamented that the specialty, the paediatric specialty as a whole, was not more serious about academia. Now, clearly that's not the case in Cambridge, <laughs> I hasten to add, but as a specialty, I think he had real concerns about that. So, serious work, uh, but 
that side, you know, David, you know, he just eschewed pomposity and egotism. He just couldn't bear it. Sometimes there'd be an apposite phrase or two in order to puncture it. Uh, other times he'd roll his eyes later with, with me. Uh, he was gloriously, gloriously irreverent. Uh, I took great, great delight in. They bring a smile to me even now with that lovely dry and laconic sense of humor. Um, a colleague in Australia, Paul, I don't know if he's online, um, but uh, he kindly emailed me and quoted it in the obituary actually, but I think it sums up a lot of what David was about. Talked about David having the driest and cheekiest humor of any professor I have met. A giant, a, a giant in our professional and scientific field, yet a humble working bee amongst the rest of us. And that drawing, can we go to that drawing, um, Jane? Oh, oh, not that one, on the first one. one. Yeah. This uh, drawing. Oh, sorry, I, I should do that. Should, is that am, I, am I doing that with a piece? Of, I probably am, aren't I? So I wanted to go, it's, it's, for, it's oh. the first one. That's the keyboard. Right. Sorry. So this drawing, I think, sums up a lot of what we're saying in terms of David's character. But I'm asking you for help, but both of you here in the room and uh, on street. This was a drawing that was done on the 17th of June 2011. Jane tells me that David was in Harrogate on that day. I don't know if any of you were. Somebody did this. There's a little swiggle as a signature. I have no idea who it was or the circumstances. If anybody was there or anybody can shed any light of that, we'd love to know. But I do think it sums up that sort of sense of mischief that David had. <laughs> now, people tell me he was so calm. And I smile a bit because I understand why they say that. He did appear was very laid back, you know, aging hippie stuff. Uh, but, you know, beneath that laid back demeanour, he wasn't as tall as calm as you might think. Mm -hmm. And there lay this ferocious intensity for work. It was always on his mind, really. He had a passion for research, for biology and physiology, uh, particularly. Uh, and he was determined that the fruits of that research should be translated through into clinical practice, because that's what that was about. That was about improving the care of young people and, crucially, their families, too. There was a real restless, restlessness to it, a restless, determined quality. And as his family, we understood and respected that. We really did. Uh, and you will heard uh, Diabetes UK from Daisy remembering how, as a young girl, she had to store her urine in the fridge on numerous occasions for some important purpose or other, or Jack being bribed with yet another ice cream on holiday, waiting, just waiting, just a little longer for the imminent arrival of a fax, it used to be, uh, or an e email. So he loved his work. He was, did do a great deal of work, but actually, you know, he, he, he did a whole heap else too, but he was absolutely not a saint. I mean, I really do, you know, sometimes very easy. He wasn't a saint. Uh, and you here will know that. Um, I loved him dearly, dearly, but he could be demanding, exasperating, and quite, quite impossible. And by his own admission often. Uh, Daisy and Jack could testify to his stubbornness, uh, not least in political arguments over the kitchen table. Although I have to say, you're not here to, to contradict this. I was better at those than he was. <laughs> uh, and sheepishly, but nonetheless fiendishly competitive over the odd game of Scrabble or two. I mean, I'd be really shocked. There he was, aging hippie laid back. Mm. And this 70th birthday, so it's the next one. Let me just see if I can get that. Yeah, so this one, I just think beautiful. I think it was Karen, who was it, who came to me, who told me that she had done this and we used it in uh, at the funeral because I just think it's lovely and I think it captures David, that photograph, all of those trials, uh, his golf, the wine. Um, and yeah, he did like playing the occasional game of golf. He learnt uh, in South End, uh, where he grew up, earning pin money as a, ca a caddy. That's how he learnt it, and he likes to play it occasionally uh, with Ken, and particularly with Carlo. Uh, and we have a prize silver plate uh, in Ittleton of a tournament that he had won, a golfing tournament he had won at Espy, I think it was. Now, alongside with the James Spence Medal and many other numerous prizes, this prize was, was a source of some pride, I have to say. And you'll see, he enjoyed a good bottle of wine, or two. Uh, good wine, not so good wine, not particularly di discriminating. And for years, the inevitable cigarettes. 
um, it would be foolish not to acknowledge that, despite my many entreaties. I tried all sorts. Um, he did, to be fair. Uh, but actually, the only thing that was even remotely effective in the short term was me emitting a really, really high-pitched, uh, silly, silly noise. I'll do it here. I'll go, Nee! And I'd do it, <laughs> I'd do it repeatedly, wherever we were, uh, outside, inside, anywhere. I was totally unembarrassable. David was not. He got very embarrassed, would laugh, <laughs> and would stop it out. Um, that was, for me, most effective. <laughs> Lastly, I want to give you this. Uh, he was, he was um, quietly but intensely proud of his children. Daisy, trained as a lawyer, uh, now with three young boys, my step-grandsons, and uh, Jack, his son. Uh, who'll be here this afternoon, I think. Um, he's a physicist now with his own toddler granddaughter. And I want to leave you with this photograph of Dave, which is one of the last photographs I took of him in April 2021 uh, with his then baby granddaughter, about eight months old. And I just think it's a lovely photograph of David. And what better to end with in a part of paediatrics, really? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jane. That was really fabulous. Um, next, our sort of the last in our sort of introductory uh, talks, um, as well as this Department of Pediatrics role, David um, was instrumental in the Institute, Institute of Metabolic Science. Um, and uh, I'm going to invite Nick as one of the co directors of the, the IMS uh, with Steve O'Reilly. And, and David um, was instrumental in, in, in designing and helping them raise the money, especially for the, the pediatric endocrine and diabetes uh, clinics uh, within the IMS, the, 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 the Western Centre, and uh, continued um, yeah, until last year as a, a member of the, uh, I call it, the, the senior management clique of the IMS, and uh, with, uh, with Nick and Steve, um, continued to plot the future of the IMS and no doubt uh, everything diabetes uh, uh, and everyone diabetes and endocrinology in, in Cambridge and, uh, and and beyond that. So delighted to, to welcome Nick. Let me just uh, stop sharing there. So um, thanks very much, uh, Ken. And if I may, I'd like uh, on behalf of the Institute of Metabolic Science to welcome everyone who's here together with us today, both those in the room and those of you joining uh, remotely online. And I, I'd like, if I can, to add to what David has said. I can't add to what Jane rather splendidly said about David's uh, domestic life, but in relation to his academic life, th his role in the Institute of Metabolic Science was very important. And as Jane said, uh, David thought Cambridge was good to him. And what I want to reiterate is the reverse. I think David was really very good uh, for Cambridge. So Cambridge has a long history of uh, research into metabolic science, but really in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, we put together a team um, who had a vision of uniting those rather disparate interests and expertise into a, a new unified Institute of Metabolic Science. And David was recruited to Cambridge, as we've heard in, in 2000, and really from the very start, he was integral uh, to that vision and to ensuring that paediatrics was a very central part of the Institute uh, as it developed. Uh, after a period of fundraising uh, with research funders and charities, which as Ken said, included uh, a rather vivid demonstration to the Garfield Western Foundation of the acute lack of space in the uh, traditional department of paediatrics, which was, uh, we can probably quietly say rather staged, uh, we were able to uh, build and finally open the Institute with uh, Wellcome Trust and MRC badging uh, in 2008. And the mission of the, the Institute then and, and now is to bring together into a single entity researchers, uh, educators, those interested in prevention and clinical care of, of diabetes, obesity and other metabolic disorders. 
And as a key member of the IMS management group, David really skillfully ensured that pediatrics was an integral part of all the elements of the IMS from, from its beginning, but whilst also ensuring really the, the role of the, the department of, of pediatrics. And I think at a risk of putting up new buildings in the spirit of uniting things is that sometimes you inadvertently create different silos and alternative barriers to collaboration. But, but David's collaborative abilities and his complete lack of concern about anything to do with territory meant that this was never going to be an issue for the IMS. So in the clinical realm, as Ken said, Ken, uh, David ensured there was a specific uh, pediatric diabetes and endocrinology clinic, the Western Center. And that was from the start part of the plans of the IMS. And that integration really helps with the smooth transition from pediatric to adult care. And the development of the IMS has a whole, has really greatly enhanced the overall uh, clinical service for diabetes and endocrinology here in Cambridge, leading the service to be named as the top European center in Newsweek's world's best specialized hospital report in 2021. David also played a major role in developing the research of the Institute. And as we'll hear today from a range of speakers, both from the Institute and his very wide set of collaborators and friends elsewhere, his interests were diverse and his contributions to the many fields in which he worked were really enormous. So I'm really grateful for the pivotal role that David played in the establishment of the Institute. And as Ken said, in setting it on the right path in its first decade. We are confident that the strong foundations that he has helped us to build, by which I mean predominantly the people that he mentored and whose careers he helped to nurture, will ensure that the success of the Institute will continue long into the future. So before I close and we open the first session, I'd like to thank particularly Ken, Vicky and Jane for all their organization of this uh, event and to all the speakers for contributing to what promises to be a very interesting day. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I'm going to hand over to Emil and Loredana to chair our first scientific session. Okay, so good morning, everyone. So it's my uh, pleasure to chair this first session with my colleague, um, Emil Hendricks. And both uh, Emil and I had the great privilege of having David as our clinical and academic supervisors for many years here in Cambridge, and to work really closely with him in the field of type 1 diabetes, which is you know, the focus of this first uh, uh, session. Uh, and during this session, we will uh, hear some highlights of the enormous uh, contribution of David to the field of pediatric uh, type 1 diabetes. Maybe we can start with the first speaker. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you to, um, to introduce Professor Kim Donahue uh, from the University of Sydney in Australia. Um, Kim is um, a pediatric endocrinologist in Sydney, and maybe she's the head of the diabetes complication service um, there. Um, and Kim is also the uh, immediate past president of ISPAD, which is the International Society for Pediatric and Adolescent um, Diabetes. And um, Kim has collaborated with David for many years, mainly uh, for uh, the ADIP trial. And we will hear from Kim um, some memories uh, from um, in her role as uh, ISPAD past president, as well as a collab a David's uh, collaborator. Uh, Kim, thanks for um, your contribution to this symposium. And looking forward to your, to your um, presentation. Thank you all. It, it is a great <coughs> honour to speak at this symposium to celebrate Professor David Duncan. I work at the University of Sydney and the Sydney Children's Hospitals Network in sunny Sydney. Most of you will recognise this photo of Sydney and let us hope that many of you can travel here in the near future. I first met David in 2002 when I was AP president and I welcomed David to Australia as the AP guest speaker at our annual scientific meeting which was held in Darwin and Kakadu. He survived all our national wildlife and I was very pleased he didn't get sunburnt. 
So I was president of ISPAD 2018 to 2020. So I'm the immediate past president. And I'm also going to speak about ADIT. I, was, I am the principal investigator for New South Wales. I lead the I outcomes and I was invited to the steering committee in 2013. David has made a tremendous contribution to ISPAD, which is the International Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes. He was elected to the advisory council in 2003 and he served the society in many ways on the program organizing committee, in the science school faculty, invited speaker at many meetings, which helped the society in its stature, and he received the society's highest honor, the prize of achievement in 2017. The society has evolved and in 2021, we added a fourth figure to the logo. You can see three figures on the left and on the right, there is an adolescent lying down. David was very passionate about adolescents growing up to be young adults without chronic complications of their diabetes. And I'm sure he would have appreciated this change. ISPAD has over a thousand professional members from 104 countries. Our mission is a better world for children, adolescents and young people with diabetes. So this is the ISPAD then president, Joseph Wolfstorff, presenting David with the ISPAD Prize of Achievement in 2017. Then this was in Innsbruck and the name of the meeting was Reaching for the Summit in Diabetes Research and Care. So very ably named at the time he received this prize. Creative ideas and innovative designs to find the causes and cure for type one diabetes characterized his approach. He will be deeply missed by all clinical and research colleagues. And this is from Karin de Beaufort, who's the current ISPAD president in her presidential message on his passing, July, 2021. And here is David enjoying an ISPAD meeting this is in 2018 in Hyderabad in India with Tim Barrett, I think. And you can see Karin de Beaufort, who is the current president of ISPAD. And at that meeting, David um, presented, presented on the Adolescent Type 1 Diabetes Intervention Trial, which is ADIT. He was the chief investigator and the this study is sponsored by the University of Cambridge. It's a three nation study, including Canada, UK and Australia. And this talk is available on the ISPAD website if you want to hear him speak. Now, these are the ADDIT pioneers uh, inspired by the Pirates of Penzance. <laughs> I presented this slide uh, at an investigators meeting some time back. So on the far left is Dennis Ganneman from Toronto, the PI for Canada. Next is David Dunga as a chief investigator. In the middle is Sally Marshall, who chairs the steering committee. Next is John De Deanfield from UCL, London, who leads the vascular outcomes. And on the right is Tim Jones from Perth, who is the PI for Australia. And the added investigators, uh, we have enjoyed meetings together face to face. This was at ISPAD in Toronto when we were in the middle of the added intervention phase. There were 32 added sites from the three countries. I don't know all the people here, but um, I can't recall all their names, but if I can talk about a few of them. If we go back row, uh, fourth from the left is Andy Cottrell from Brisbane. Bruce King from Newcastle, David, uh, myself from Sydney, and then Liz Davis from Perth, and on the far right, Dennis Danneman, who organised the photo. On the front row is Tim Jones uh, on the left, the PI from Australia, Phil Bergman from Melbourne, Farid Mahmood, who now leads the Canadian ADIT study, 
uh, Carlo Assarini from Cambridge, who was a big part of the study. Then Fergus Cameron uh, from Melbourne, Yasmina Ella, who coordinates the Canadian study, and Maria Craig from Sydney. So this is the ADIT trial study design. ADIT is supported by JDRF, Diabetes UK, British Heart Foundation and Pfizer, who supplied the placebo. And for the study, 4,407 adolescents were screened for eligibility. They were aged 11 to 16 years and had type 1 diabetes for more than one year. The screening was two sets of three consecutive early morning urine specimen to be measured for albumin creatinine ratio. And the adolescents then were stratified to high or low risk ACR turtiles adjusted for age, sex and duration. There were 1,287 adolescents stratified to the high risk and from that 443 consented to, the, to be randomised to the placebo controlled study which need, for which they needed to take two tablets once a day. The intervention was crinopril, 5 to 10 milligrams a day, and or atorvastatin, 10 milligrams a day. The duration of the study was two to four years and ran for a median of 2.6 years. The analysis was a two by two factorial design and there were only 18% dropouts. So the study results, the ACE inhibitor versus placebo, the, the systolic blood pressure was borderline lower. 25% had dosage reductions in the ACE inhibitor from the 10 milligrams to five milligrams because of dizziness. And then there was a reduced reduction in cystatin C. Comparing statin versus placebo, there was a significantly lower total cholesterol, LD or cholesterol, triglycerides, APOB to APOA ratio. The hemoglobin A1C increased across time in all the groups. The primary outcome was the albumin creatinine ratio area under the curve, and this did not change significantly. The secondary outcomes, the ACE inhibitor versus placebo reduced the cumulative incidence of microalbuminuria, which I'll show in the next slide. The carotid intermediate thickness was not different between the groups. The retinopathy progression was not different. The ACE inhibitor versus placebo did improve endothelial function as measured by flow mediated dilatation. And the study ran from 2009 to 2015, and the results were published in the New England Journal in November 2017. And our chairperson is the first author, as you can see. And this is the secondary outcome of reduction in microalbuminuria, comparing ACE inhibitors, which is the dotted line, compared to placebo and the cumulative pr probability of microalbuminuria. The adjusted hazard ratio was 0.58, but the p-value was 0.03, which was not what was required for a secondary outcome to be significant. The p-value needed to be less than 0.01. And this is the secondary outcome of retinopathy, and this is the section I led with Paul Benitez Aguirre, whom you have um, heard, heard quoted by Jane. And this was interesting when we first looked at the data, comparing the statin versus the placebo, it looked as if there might be some effect, but this wasn't sustained. The adjusted hazard ratio was 0.83 with confidence intervals that crossed unity. So that was a New England Journal paper. The next uh, I want to talk about is the vascular effects of the ACE inhibitor. And this came out in hypertension. And this did show a positive benefit of the ACE inhibitor for flow-mediated dilatation, FMD. The trial results were also compared to the observational group, and the high ACR had worse FMD than the low ACR group. And I'll show you this in figures. The top part of the figure is the trial, and the placebo is in red and the intervention in green. 
baseline and final on each panel. And at the end of the study, there was an improved endothelial function in those on the ACE inhibitor with the dilatation being 6.6% compared to 5.3%. There was no improvement, no benefit of statins for this outcome. And down the bottom is the high ACR uh, in red and the low ACR in, in green. And there was a difference in flow-mediated dilatation, 4.8 versus 6.3% at the end point. Moving on to the medication adherence. Now, these, of course, were adolescents and uh, people were not expecting them to be very adherent. But during the trial, it was actually 80.2% is the median for those who use MEMS and 86% for the pill count. Now, the MEMS was a very interesting part of the study. This is medication event monitoring, and it was a magnetic device in the cap of the pill bottle. So the adolescents had to bring the bottles back and the cap was downloaded and they received a new pill bottle to go on that cap. The adherence did drop during the trial, 93 to 76%. And you can see it was lower using the number of times the bottle was opened compared to the pill count, 96 to 79%. And that's shown in the figure here with the pill count uh, being the dotted line, uh, the, the, the dotted line and the men's being the strong line. So this is going, you can see there's a reduction over time, but still it stayed generally above 75% even at the end. And then this is a study in 2008 showing that the high risk model was confirmed. The high ACR compared to the low ACR had more microalbuminuria and they had worse carotid media intima thickness, which is a surrogate for vascular disease used in study. And this is showing you the figure, the risk of microalbuminuria, the high ACR versus the low ACR. The adjusted hazard ratio was 4.3. And so 16% developed it in the high risk compared to the low risk group, the low ACR group. And this is the cardiovascular risk at the end. The high ACR compared to the low ACR had higher CIMT at 0.45 millimetres in green compared to 0.43 millimetres in blue. And lastly, the uh, looking at three-step retinopathy progression, the high ACR versus the low ACR did predict an increase in retinopathy and the adjusted hazard ratio was 2.1. And in the high-risk group, adding the haemoglobin A1C above the median did not actually further increase the risk. And this is shown in the figure here. This came out this year in Diabetologia. And Paul, um, had we included a very nice um, in memoriam to, to David. So this is comparing the low in blue to the high ACR. There was a greater cumulative hazard for the three-step progression. And on the right, you can see there are actually four groups. But one of the about the orange group and the red group are on top of each other. They're the high ACR, and there was no difference with the high hemoglobin A1C compared to the lower hemoglobin A1C in that group. So, in conclusion, dear attendees and family and friends and colleagues, I have been privileged to have worked with David, with ISPAD, and with ADIT. He has made an enormous contribution to diabetes research and care. The ADIT trial was a tremendously ambitious study. Many thought it couldn't be done, but it was done and David led that. And I particularly like this logo, which we wore on the t-shirts in that earlier photo I showed in Toronto. It's a, it says, keep at it. And I'm sure David would want us to keep at it. Thank you. Kim, thanks a lot for your presentation, for your contributions as well, highlighting you know, all the um, added results, but many probably added means a lot in terms of a great, you know, great collaboration that David established, you know, across, you know, um, across three countries. 
at the value of uh, these collaborations, which um, we all want to keep, you know, as a legacy or in memory of David, as we, I think we all highlighted the first time we met together on a steering committee without David. Thanks again, Kim. And if not, my colleague to introduce next. Uh, it's my pleasure to um, introduce our next speaker. Um, I'm going to welcome Professor John Todd. We saw it uh, in the little slideshow that plays, and we'll probably also play in the break, uh, David's long kind of journey to Cambridge. Um, uh, John has been around with David for, for some of that journey um, as well. I know you've worked closely together in both Oxford and, and Cambridge over the years. Uh, John was professor of, um, or is professor of medical genetics uh, here in Cambridge, now um, in Oxford, professor um, and head of the, um, the Welcome Centre for Human Genetics. Thank you, John, for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you, Emil. Uh, let me share my slides. Thank, thanks, everyone. And uh, it's a great pleasure and honour to um, give this uh, presentation today. Let me. Um, Share my screen. Can people see that first slide? Yes. Great. All right. Um, my my journey with with David began in 1988 when I, I returned uh, from Stanford uh, to Oxford, and I bumped into him in the corridors of the um, John Radcliffe Hospital. I was in surgery. He was obviously in, in pediatrics. And uh, we, we did have a lot of common uh, in common. We absolutely enjoyed research and interacting with people. It, it, it wasn't a job. It was a passion and vocation. Um, we also realized that genetics and biomarkers were very important. And during those very early years, uh, when we realized that we, we, we had common aims and ambitions, we struck a grand bargain. And that was that uh, David would, would help us uh, gather, collect the samples to do the genetics, to solve the genetics of type 1 diabetes using all his clinical pediatric our contacts across the, ten, uh, the NHS. And uh, that, um, and, and in return, we would collect families where uh, nephropathy could be studied, so the nephropathy family study, because he wanted to understand the genetics of diabetic nephropathy and, um, and identify biomarkers. And, and recently, there has been progress, certainly, in the genetics of this very complicated condition, um, uh, diabetic nephropathy, which is still a huge unmet clinical need. Uh, there was a convergence uh, and coalescence around the insulin gene because it's a major type 1 diabetes gene. And of course, it's next door to IGF-2 uh, and H19. And one of David's favorite proteins, IGF-1, and quite often we'd go and talk about an operational matter in, 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 in collecting and studying families and cases and controls, but almost always we'd end up talking about IGF-1 and, and growth in babies. And uh, uh, that, that was very uh, educational for me. I, I learned a lot during those numerous meetings. So our first publication together, uh, in 1992 was in uh, Nature Genetics, and uh, uh, that was the first of uh, about 40 publications that um, I, I co-authored with David uh, over the, the um, uh, last 30 or so years. That was followed in 98 um, uh, with another Nature Genetics paper, again, the insulin variant associated this time with size at birth. Uh, notice the prevalence of Ken Ong, uh, and, uh, and, and, and as Ken said, he's been a, a constant productive collaborator with um, David over many years, 
And I know from the very beginning how supportive David was of, of Ken in, in every way possible. Um, also there in 1999, you can see Ken's first author this time, another Nature Genetics uh, about uh, the insulin VMTR. And, um, and I'm glad to say that in 2019 in Nature Genetics, one of the huge diabetes birth weight consortia published replication of this region of chromosome 11 with a, a p-value um, not far off the inverse of Avogadro's number, um, but less 10 to the minus 22 in a study of 300,000 individuals. So it's, it's always good to get a, a replication evidence uh, and a further understanding of, of the association of this gene and, and its region with not only with type 1 diabetes, but also type 2 diabetes and birth weight. So um, we now enter three amazing years. Uh, so in 98, I, um, I left uh, Oxford uh, to join a brand new building in, in Cambridge with uh, Keith Peters, who was the Regis at the time. Uh, in early um, 1999, the first idea of the Diabetes and Inflammation Laboratory, the DIL, uh, was, began to be discussed with the director of JDRF at the time, the brilliant Bob Goldstein, and his wing person, Marie Nears, who were at, at, uh, based in New York at JDRF headquarters. And uh, they were incredibly dis uh, decisive, productive, very supportive of genetics. And uh, in, in May later that year, 1999, Bob wrote very clearly and transparently to the welcome director at the time, that was Mike Dexter, about this idea of, of starting a major genetics operation uh, called, uh, called the JDRF Welcome Trust Diabetes and Information Lab. In January 2000, um, uh, Bob wrote to the Welcome and said, JDRF, we're going to fund the lab, the, the, the project, the program, uh, with $4 million per year uh, each year for five years. And, and that really catalyzed Mike Dexter and the Welcome to match uh, uh, that funding. Uh, on St. Patrick's Day in the year 2000, David told all of his colleagues and collaborators, I think the email went out to about 150 people, announcing his new position and address at Addenbrooke's Hospital. Uh, in, in 1999, uh, I'd begun conversations with David about coming to um, uh, Cambridge and, and, and what a fantastic place and what a great opportunity. And he sort of said, well, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it might be a good time to leave Oxford Pediatrics. And uh, we went through the normal procedures and, and David won the chair uh, with help from many people, including Steve O'Reilly. And as, as I say on St. Patrick's Day, I, I went that email. Shortly after that, the next month, David prepared a budget for 10 million pounds to collect 10,000 cases in 1,000 families. Now, at, at the time, um, there was no mass uh, genotyping method for doing genome-wide associations, but we were planning ahead, probably planning further ahead than in almost any other common disease. Uh, and, and that number of 10,000 um, came to fruition, and it really gave us the ability to thoroughly work out the genetics of type 1 diabetes. Later in the year, the uh, JDRF and Welcome awarded David and I and Nick Wareham uh, and others over $40 million in the first grant, which was renewed over five quinquennial periods for three times, and in fact ends next year, um, so 23 years of, of effort. Uh, and at the time, as Keith Peters said, uh, this was the largest single grant that the University of Cape, the, the Clinical School of Cambridge had ever got for uh, salaries, fellowships, consumables and equipment. Uh, this was the launch event in, um, in 2000, which we held in London. And um, uh, 
this is Linda Wicker, who was also a co-applicant on that major application. Uh, Linda's been my co-director of the lab for over 30 years. Um, our personal assistant at the time was the amazing Judy Brown, who worked with us for 21 years. She, um, I returned to Oxford five years ago and she wasn't able to join us. Uh, there's David, looking David-like. Uh, there's a very young, handsome Nick Wareham there on the right-hand side. And um, I, this was to celebrate the life of Bob Goldstein, uh, the JDRF director. And I've, I've done something cheeky here and pasted uh, Bob's um, head portrait on the top of that person. And that person is St Steve Redgrave, the, the five uh, Olympic gold medal winner for rowing. And uh, I just wanted to really highlight what an important role Bob had in, in this whole enterprise. So that, that number of cases and families allowed us to do very statistically powered genetics. And, and I, the, the many papers came out of it, but one of the most cited was, uh, along with the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, was, um, again, replicating some of the findings in the main Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium paper, which was published at the same time in, in Nature, which is now a citation classic with over 5,000 citations. But in this study, our lab really used every sample that a DNA sample, blood sample, uh, that, that David had collected over almost 200 hospitals, uh, getting blood samples from um, type 1 diabetic children as they came in for their MOT each year. And uh, we not only confirmed some of the results, but we also did probably one of the first fine mapping where you try to work out what is the gene in the region that might actually be causal. And that that paper also has been cited almost a thousand times. So um, finally, uh, as often in life, things come full circle. So we made an amazing connection in the last five years, uh, whilst in, back in Oxford, between one of the most powerful T1D genes, HLA-DQ, uh, T cell reactivity to the primary autoantigen, which is insulin itself, discovered a functional uh, key mimicry in the bacterial microbiome of the, the uh, primary insulin epitopes involved in autoimmune diabetes. And we're writing that up at the minute for a top journal. Uh, if people want to see it, it is in Med Archive. Um, uh, search for uh, John A. Todd, um, and, and there's a version of all the results there. And at the end of the acknowledgements of, of that paper, um, I wrote uh, a, a dedication um, uh, to David and also to Bob and also my uh, first postdoc advisor, Hugh McDivitt in Stanford. And uh, those three individuals had a huge influence on me and on the entire field. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John, for a, a beautiful talk. And um, I think it really highlights that David didn't only set up trials to, um, to study the effects on the patients and improve care of the patients, actually also was really always very interested in physiology in basic mechanisms and, and really, really worked on both aspects, um, which, which made him all the more broad and, and, and and amazing to work with. Thank you, John, for that. Thank you. Okay, so we will we'll be staying in Oxford for the next presentation, which is from uh, Dr. Julie A. Yeah. Um, Julie, yeah. a., Julie is a consultant in pediatric uh, diabetes in Oxford. And as you will hear directly from her in her presentation, she is also, she was David's first uh, research fellow in Oxford. Um, and Julie will give us an overview of David's research and clinical work in Oxford. 
So uh, Julie's presentation is recorded, is pre-recorded because she cannot be with us today due to other commitments, but we are really grateful to her for contributing to this symposium. And she also asked me to say something on a healthy heart. So she wants to apologize if she was not able to mention all the people who work with David in Oxford. Um, but I'm sure that we will all understand that it's difficult today to mention everyone, even you know that big number of people who trained or worked with David over the years. Okay. Firstly, a big hello to colleagues around the world. And I'm sorry we can't all be together celebrating David's life. Thanks very much to the organisers, particularly Ken, for inviting me to talk about uh, David's years in Oxford and the study, studies that were carried out during this time. I don't want to present this as a rather dry list of studies, graphs and slides of written results, partly because I can't find them now. I thought it'd be more interesting to concentrate on linking the studies with many of the wonderful people that David worked with during those years and just demonstrating the vast range of his ideas and interests. It was important to him to bring people together academically and socially, so there are perhaps more photos of punting and parties than is usual in an academic talk. He started work in Oxford in 1986 as a general paediatrician with an interest in endocrinology and diabetes. However, he wasn't having to start the diabetes service from scratch, as it had already been uh, well, become well known as one of the first specialist services in the UK under David Baum, and already had the wonderful Sally Strang working as one of the children's diabetes nurses in the country. David was an excellent general paediatrician, very intuitive, child-focused and very psychologically astute. He was sorry when he had to give up that later on to become more specialist and to have more time for his research. From the point of view of children's diabetes, it might be worth reminding any younger listeners and perhaps some of us older ones uh, of what the management of type 1 diabetes was like in 1986. There were only around 100 children in the, in the Oxford clinic, but the incidence doubled over the time that David was in Oxford here, which is the time period shown in the circle. There was no type 2 diabetes here at that time, and there were perhaps two children who had developed it under the age of five. The red bars show later incidence under fives, which dramatically increased. Type 1 was managed using once or twice daily insulin, which is generally isophane and soluble, and it was freely mixed in a syringe. This resulted in high blood glucose levels during the day and low levels uh, during the morning, with frequent nocturnal hypos. Carbohydrate was counted in exchanges and spread through the day to control blood glucose levels, and blood glucose testing was recommended once a day, resulting in this type of logbook and a lot of made up blood glucose values. David realised that things needed to change, and so he started on a lifetime journey of research projects which hasn't been equalled in the UK children's diabetes field or perhaps in the world. He was quick off the mark because within six months of him starting in Oxford, I was installed as the first of many research fellows, the first few of us being funded by Novo. My project was to look at insulin resistance during puberty compared to non-diabetic adolescents and related to growth hormone levels, IGF-1 and IGF binding protein levels. The methodology for this and for many of the other fellows uh, working after me was based on overnight studies on the ward, clamping blood glucose levels with variable rate insulin, which allowed us to calculate insulin requirement and taking blood samples every 15 minutes, which were later analysed by me, Dot Harris and Angie Watts in the lab. The equipment we used was the best that 1987 technology had to offer, and this included the latest and possibly one of the first uh, Apple personal computers to calculate the insulin dose needed to maintain new glycemia. This was based on an algorithm which had been worked out by David Matthews from the time series analysis that he'd been working on. It also included a full glucose, the, the equipment included a full glucose analyzer, which we had to do every 15 minutes through the night. Nowadays, this whole system shown here is basically a closed loop on three small devices. And it was an, on a big trolley and took two of us to push around the ward. Although the young people were wired up to a continuous insulin infusion on one arm and a sampling cannula on the other, most of them slept, and their initial terror at the idea, shown here, 
was unfounded, shown here, shown by drawings from one of the young people. Having shown that insulin resistance increased through puberty, that growth hormone levels were, levels were related to the insulin resistance, and that diabetic children had resistance and growth hormone levels at least twice higher than non-diabetic children, I left for Australia. Rani Powell for a short time and then Tim Cheatham were then employed as research fellows. Tim used his night times and the same technology to give IGF-1 to children with diabetes and showed that it reduced the overnight growth hormone levels and improved insulin resistance. Carlo Acciarini then arrived and he and David started to uh, carry out longer term IGF-1 administration studies, giving IGF-1 in uh, one of two doses or placebo to 53 young uh, to adolescents for 24 weeks, which was no mean feat. Uh, this was a successful study and resulted in a paper in The Lancet, showing that long-term administration of IGF-1 resulted in initial improvements in HbA1c levels and no adverse events. However, this direction of study couldn't carry on any further because of safety concerns and the company with, withdrew the IGF-1 formulation. So no further studies went down that route. And all the while this was going on, David hadn't been idle. I'll go through briefly some of the other avenues down which David had been uh, traveling. Uh, and he was aided by many more research fellows, some coming for a year, two years, three years maybe, many overseas fellows and consultants, and also a group of clinical registrars and senior registrars who he uh, involved in various studies and who most of whom have gone on to be consultants around the UK. Chris Matika, unfortunately I couldn't find a photo of Chris, came and looked at nocturnal hypoglycemia in free living children, that is in their own homes. She stayed awake all night next to their bed at home with the same sort of sampling equipment as I had used and an ECG. Importantly, blood glucose levels were only measured later, so she wasn't tempted to intervene. She found that symptoms such as sweating did not predict hypoglycemia. Cognition and mood were measured the next morning by her. Interestingly, the only effect was on mood. The ECGs were examined for cardiac repolarization, which Nuala Murphy and Liz Crown uh, in this photo also helped with. This all demonstrated frequent nocturnal hypoglycemia on the insulin regimens available of the, in the day at the time, with blunted counter-regulation and frequently prolonged QTC intervals, which might have been related to hypokalemia, resulting from high insulin levels overnight, with possible implications for sudden death uh, overnight from hypoglycemia. So these and other studies showed that insulin reg regimens of the time did not control blood glucose levels uh, adequately through the day or night. And so this led on to several new insulin studies, including comparisons of soluble insulin and Lyspro, and the first study of insulin glargine in children. Another major branch of research which was outside type 1 diabetes and which David was involved with and uh, helped to set up was the Oxford Growth Study, a large community-based uh, height screening study of children aged three and four and a half years uh, in Oxford between 1988 and 1984. Lynn Ahmed, shown here, who later continued in Cambridge with David, was the researcher on this and she later obtained a PhD in 2009, largely from Davis' support, otherwise known as nagging. However, growth in type 1 diabetes was not neglected and Lynn carried out a major longitudinal study of growth in children with diabetes through puberty. Ken Ong was uh, recruited by David to come to Oxford and helped with various studies, including the growth studies, insulin studies, and also started his interest in children born short, small for gestational age, and the relation with type 2 diabetes in Oxford, particularly uh, with using the data from the ALSPAC uh, study. You will have noticed that all the trainees of Oxford were involved in multiple studies, and David was very good at getting people to take on the next project and also uh, helping get everybody publications. Carlo, in his spare time, carried out studies in children with celiac disease and type 1 diabetes, 
Rakesh Amin was also in Oxford for a year on specialist training from London and was roped into the celiac study and also carried out uh, early studies on continuous glucose monitoring. In around 1992, in the clinical diabetes service, we had a child who suffered severe cerebral edema as a result of DKA. This prompted David to look at our DKA protocols and to start a process in a pub in Oxford during the BSPD meeting of 1993 of comparing uh, national DKA guidelines and looking at the incidence of cerebral edema around the country and from that to start looking for possible causes of cerebral edema. I was back from Australia by then as a senior registrar, although albeit with small children, so I took on the audit of DKA protocols and Martha Ford Adams, shown here, and I did a study of the causes of death in children with type 1 diabetes and then the large BPSU case control study of cerebral edema. This demonstrated that giving insulin within the first hour of treatment and larger fluid volumes within the first four hours were related to increased risk of cerebral edema. This all led to major changes in fluid rates and particularly composition of fluids in national and international DKA guidelines and uh, contributed to both the SP and Lawson Wilkins consensus statement on diabetic ketoacidosis and the, the first uh, ISPAD clinical practice guidelines in 2006-2007. Of course, the other big uh, study which David started very early on during his time in Oxford was the Oxford Regional Prospective Study. It's hard to believe uh, that this started in, uh, began in 1986, the year that David started in Oxford. This major study followed 500 children for many years up until the ADDIT study began, which Kim has already uh, talked about. The Bart's Oxford study, uh, which had been started in 1985, uh, already uh, was uh, using the uh, regional setup uh, in, the, in the Oxford region. So David capitalised on the goodwill of regional paediatricians with an interest in diabetes to set up ORPS. Um, and thanks to all the regional paediatricians, diabetes nurses and the ORPS nurses, this was extremely successful and you've already heard how it paved the way for ADDIT. Indeed, as time went on, we in Oxford didn't think a study was a real study unless we were collecting large quantities of urine from children. As well as the physiological side of diabetes, David was also very interested in the psychological. The clinical service was pioneering, and I can't not mention Mary Lindsay, uh, who was a child psychiatrist and had done 20 years of pioneering liaison work in paediatric clinics and also Valerie Sheldon, who was a social worker who had worked with David uh, at Great Ormond Street and came to work in Oxford. Transition to the Young Adult Clinic was particularly problematic. Uh, David and Andrew Neal from the Young Adult Clinic rather depressingly looked at the prognosis of childhood diabetes in the young adult years, which was not good in terms of psychological health or eyesight uh, or renal function and many young people just defaulted from clinic attendance during those years to turn up later with major problems. They then looked at different transition models around the Oxford region and tried to work out which aspects were more successful. As well as that they, were, as that, they worked together on studies of menstrual dysfunction, the relation to PCOS and also eating patterns and adolescence in young adults and all of this information has been used to create better models of transition around the country. So I've gone through a large range of studies uh, which uh, David started in Oxford. Um, during the same time he was a busy clinician and was also involved in endocrine research. There are two aspects of the way he worked which seemed to me very important. One of those was that David, during his time in Oxford and probably in Cambridge too, was to bring in young trainees and researchers and to guide them and train them clinically and in research techniques and then mentor them and look after them and follow their careers after that. All of the trainees and fellows who I've shown you in photos became the children's diabetes and endocrinology consultants at most of the major centres around the UK. So basically most were taught by David and they were friends and colleagues in later years and later research projects. Basically, it was impossible to say no by that stage. The other major aspect of his research brain was to be able to take ideas from several disciplines, some of them not even medical, and put them together into an idea for a project. 
He didn't always remember everything in the right order, but he was great at talking through ideas and then giving you the idea that it was your project and you should do it and not him. And I'm sure Carlo and Ken would have said the same thing. And I'm sure he was still coming up with new ideas until his untimely death. He loved social events and this was how he bound the team together. We went punting many times, but actually I thought I could really only show one photo. Lynn and I spent uh, a lovely couple of hours, um, sort of a bittersweet memories, recalling many leaving do's, parties and the wonderful collages uh, that Andy used, Angie used to put together. David was greatly missed when he left Oxford, although most of us did continue seeing and working with him on all the other projects for many years after. It was said, particularly by many parents of the, uh, the children, that he was very laid back although not all of us felt so. However, this is one photograph and memory I have of him following a challenging day at a children's diabetes camp near Oxford. So sometimes he did have a lie down. He was probably still thinking though. It was a privilege to have worked with him and thank you very much for listening. It's really hope it's lovely all of you have been spending this in Oxford and for sharing. Um, I think the David's passion for physiological studies that then carried on also when he moved uh, to Cambridge. I also to remind him also the all the fellows who trained with David. The one thing that I think we all had in common if often we share is that uh, you could not be a uh, you could not end your fellowship with David without doing some overnight studies. <laughs> that was a must. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The last um, topic in our in our diabetes session of this morning is um, what I think might have been David's biggest piece of work, but it's hard to know what David's biggest piece of work is. But uh, is um, the establishment of the Enodia Consortium, the European wide consortium, where he brought together adult and pediatric diabetologists. So I'm very happy that we're getting. Um, this talk by Professor Mark Evans, who's adult diabetologist and uh, professor of diabetic medicine here at the University of Cambridge. Hello, my name is Mark Evans and I'm a professor of diabetic medicine in Cambridge. And I'm extremely honored to have been asked to talk to you today for a few minutes about one of the many aspects of the legacy that David has left us. And I'm going to talk about Enodia, which, as I'll show you, is a, a behemoth of a collaboration, a partnership between academic partners, industry, uh, patient groups, charities, brought together under the umbrella of the Horizon 2020 programme for the European Union to create this critical mass of people interested in type 1 diabetes. And in particular, this has been a program that's aimed to map out and understand better the processes leading up to type 1 diabetes. But critically there, you can see underlined, trying to arrest type 1 diabetes. And I'll, I'll unpick for you what uh, this means by trying to arrest type 1 diabetes. So these are, are my disclosures. And really to set the rationale for this, and many of you listening will be familiar with this schematic, but for those who aren't, this really illustrates the sort of sea change that we've undergone in our thinking about type 1 diabetes over the last few years. So when I was a medical student, for example, and people presented with a few days or weeks of symptoms, uh, the assumption was that there'd been some sort of trigger that had created this disastrous tsunami, tidal wave of immune damage, which had swept in, wiped out all of the insulin producing potential, and then receded, leaving people with burnt out, insulopenic type 1 diabetes. Actually, of course, we now know that type 1 diabetes is far more progressive. And what I was taught was type 1 diabetes is really now represented in the schematic as stage 3, so clinical uh, insulin requiring type 1 diabetes. But importantly, there's this long progression towards that with people developing autoimmunity, 
developing disc glycemia, and then finally crossing the threshold to having clinical diabetes. And of course, the implications of this is, uh, is uh, quite profound because it means that if we're able to identify, capture people along this progression, that we can harness some of the modern biological mechanisms, some of the <coughs> excuse me, the new treatments which are targeting very specific facets of the immune system to delay, prevent, or even arrest type 1 diabetes along its progression. And really this underpins the rationale that underpins Enodia. So presciently back in 2014, David, Chantal Mathieu from Leuven, and a number of other people came together to develop the Enodia Consortium. And the idea was to bring together all of this expertise, including also basic science to understand more, but really to develop this clinical network across Europe to map out, understand, and to very, very importantly, develop clinical trials in immunotherapy for type 1 diabetes. As you can see there, both with the combination of Enodia and some follow-up funding uh, called Enodia Harvest, I brought together a huge number of partners from academia um, and industry, over 40 million euros in, in funding to create this, uh, this infrastructure. Like all uh, big European uh, projects and indeed others, this is Corral stratified into a series of work packages. And I'm extremely grateful to uh, uh, Emil Hendricks for sharing this image with me. Many of us who've worked with David over the years will be familiar with sitting in his office up on, uh, on level eight while David's brain was whirring away, but also his pen would be whirring away. And David had this remarkable ability to be able to simultaneously talk and draw out, map out these fantastic uh, schematics of, uh, that explained his thinking. And it's something I've tried to do, but I just never really managed to capture the clarity and uh, um, intensity with which uh, David was able to, to do this. So clearly for brevity, I'm not going to go through all of these today, but I'm just going to uh, show you a couple of the, I think, important work packages. And perhaps to illustrate this best, I'm showing you here, first of all, an overview of the timeline of Anodia. Uh, to date and uh, into the sort of the near future. And if I just uh, pick out some of the highlights for you. So back in 2015, this was launched as a, a consortium. Like uh, all of these big consortiums, it takes time to get up and running. But critically, you can see here on World Diabetes Day in 2016, the first newly diagnosed uh, type 1 diabetes participant was recruited. So what was it people were being recruited into? So one of the workhorse work packages of Enodia has been, it's been referred to as the natural history study. So you can see here a, a summary of this. So over 700 people, um, actually a few more with including people from control cohorts from some of the clinical studies, but recruited in, but also recruiting and screening first degree relatives to try to identify people along that progressive pathway towards type 1 diabetes. Of course, most people who are screened are negative, but uh, a significant subset are positive for autoantibodies and potentially on the pathway towards type 1 diabetes. And you can see here that most of these have agreed to be followed up then so that we can phenotype the progression through. And some of these people, of course, have gone on to develop type 1 diabetes. So the measures phenotyping that was done uh, was uh, pretty uh, intense, uh, but uh, and included, for example, omics um, with, uh, and again, presently, as we move now into the era of big data with uh, lots of measures across different uh, different facets of biology. But I think one of the things that uh, 
David in particular was uh, particularly proud of was, and this is bigger than just Anodia, has been his contribution to develop and validate this, I think, really innovative and fantastic method of trying to measure in a sympathetic and uh, meaningful way insulin production, beta cell function. And clearly this is critical to uh, the sort of information we're trying to pull out of Anodia, either in the natural history or in clinical trial studies. Imaging really hasn't, uh, to date, it's, it's fantastically exciting, but really to date hasn't, uh, uh, hasn't sort of delivered a way of measuring what's happening with, uh, with beta cell mass. And so traditionally, the way in which people do it would be a functional assay, we're bringing participants into a clinical research facility and doing formal glucose tolerance tests or mixed meal tests with measures of insulin production and C-peptide. Anybody who's had a, uh, a glucose tolerance test will have been, I think, surprised by just how unpleasant the process it is. And that's for adults. And of course, for children, uh, we really need something far more sympathetic. And so working with colleagues, David has pioneered this at-home, easy, dried blood spot C-peptide assay. You can see there the filter paper where people uh, your finger prick and dab samples onto the, uh, onto the card there. This can then be posted back, for example, uh, and the paper I'm showing you here, for example, is a quality control, a, uh, a paper in which uh, reassuringly this seemed to have a good correlation with formal plasma measures of C-peptide. Of course, this allows us to fill in far more of the gaps of what's happening in terms of the natural history at home, but also to parachute this into uh, to clinical studies more easily. There have been scientific publications coming out of this, so uh, 50 publications here, now over 100 uh, publications. But the other, I think, highlight for me, particularly as a clinician and a clinical trialist, has been the progression through to clinical trials, so intervention studies looking at immunotherapy. And as part of this, David and colleagues created and got approved by the uh, European Medicines Agency, a master protocol. Uh, and really this has been one of the key things for the uh, clinical studies, having an approved master protocol, which other clinical studies can, uh, can, can be tagged on. Building on this, then the first clinical trials then started, uh, you can see here in December. And as a snapshot, there are currently four clinical trials actively uh, recruiting in the Anodia network. We have three of them active and recruiting in Cambridge, for example. And so a number of mechanistic studies using this, uh, this master protocol there, and you can see that some of these are collaborations with uh, biotech industry, some are uh, academically led uh, studies. Uh, these recruitment data are, are, are out of date now, but it gives a feel for uh, what is happening here. And the dream, of course, is ultimately to halt further disease progression. All of these studies are in the ones listed here in stage three type one diabetes. But of course, the obvious vision for this is to move this back further up the pipeline and to start to intervene to delay and indeed arrest type 1 diabetes. I told you there were 40 partners uh, as part of Anodia, but critically, broader than this, there are many more recruiting centres feeding into uh, the Anodia consortium. Uh, I wasn't even able to capture all of these on a map, but just to give you a feel here, you can see just how many centers there are and clustered particularly in the United Kingdom, something again, David would have been particularly proud of as a legacy. To, so we've built up this international platform of centers recruiting into newly diagnosed type one diabetes studies. But of course the, the, the work doesn't finish here and uh, really, again, something that David would have been I think particularly proud of is that Enodia is now looking to the future and beyond the European Union Horizon 2020 uh, uh, funding. So Enodia finishes uh, next year in 2023, harvest then uh, the year after. But this is now trying to 
strategically to build on this and what's been achieved so far to accelerate innovation. Lots of new biological agents coming into this area, lots of studies coming in. And of course, these can be uh, piggybacked onto the Anodia platform, use the master protocol and can deliver meaningful studies then. So, and of course, all of this is now moving into screening and delay arresting type 1 diabetes at stage 1, stage 2, and perhaps even preventing. With, again, it depends what one means by the word prevention, but this is really the excitement uh, for many of us of, uh, of where this work has, uh, has led to. The other really exciting thing is that this has led to collaborations beyond Europe, the, uh, a major collaboration with a similar network in Australia, trial net and the immune tolerance network in the US, but indeed many other parts of the country. And we're, we're, we're as a legacy to David's vision, we're now moving into excitingly having a global network of clinical trial networks and centers interested in trying to work together to arrest type 1 diabetes. I wanted perhaps just to finally finish by using this platform just to uh, give my personal reflections on my time working with David. I, I'd known him for 20 years. I arrived in Cambridge just after the millennium. And although it's a cliche, uh, it really is true that it's really only since his passing that many of us, I think, have appreciated just the magnitude uh, and the impact that he's made to the world of type 1 diabetes. David, of course, achieved this by on occasions being very forthright and driven and his, his vision uh, for all of this. And there are times when I was on the receiving end of, uh, of that vision. But really, I, I'm very proud to have called him a, a colleague and a friend over two decades in Cambridge. And many of us working in type 1 diabetes uh, are benefiting from the legacy that he's left with us. Thank you all for your attention. View of um, you know the beautiful reflections on on David. Thank you. Um, so we've had a, an hour full of of, um, of David's legacy in type one diabetes. An hour is nowhere near enough to really um, touch touch even touch it. Um, uh, what I'd like to end with is actually um, we're, we're treating a child with type one diabetes today and yesterday here in Cambridge um, as part of the Melt ATT trial. And um, based on the you know the app platform, I think actually David has, as we've seen, touched our, our careers, has um, touched type one diabetes research, has moved that forward with big strides. But actually, you can see it's his legacy he continues to touch uh, children with type one diabetes. And I know um, that actually the patient was always what he really did it for, um, even though there was a lot going on as well in the research and the and the basic science. It was for the patient was David's main motivation. Um, so I thought I thought that would be very timely that we're doing that today. Um, it's time for lunch. Yeah, let me, uh, thank you very much, Emil and Rodana. Thank you for everyone for a, a, a really terrific morning so far. Thank you to uh, those who provided chats, uh, to uh, Steve O'Reilly, Sandra Mel Renan for your comments and invite others. And I'll leave at lunchtime just to, um, Chris Kellner gave his uh, apologies that he couldn't uh, join us. He sent uh, his, his, his sort of personal appreciation as well. And uh, Chris and David CC work with fellow senior registrars in Great Ormond Street together and continue to collaborate um, closely to, to, together. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there and invite yeah, other contributions and uh, uh, comments on, on the chat. We'll have a short lunch break and meet again at uh, 1.15. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. Okay. Uh, so, welcome to the session in the afternoon. Um, so, my, my name is um, Dr. AJ Tankamoni. I'm one of the uh, consultants in here doing pediatric endocrinology. I work with David more than a decade and mainly work on work on growth hormone IGF1 axis. And this particular session is mainly on growth and puberty, which is uh, with my area of research. 
And it is my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Malcolm Donaldson as the first speaker of the session. Um, Malcolm is a consultant pediatrician, uh, um, an endocrinologist, and an honorary senior, senior research fellow in Glasgow University School of Medicine. And uh, I thank Malcolm to come here for a face to face presentation. Um, uh, welcome, Malcolm. Thank you. Um, Thank you, AJ. Um, what can I say about David Dunger that hasn't already been said? Uh, following Jane's wonderful introduction and a series of excellent lectures, we know about the man, his humongous intellect, his ferocious work ethic, his prolific research and publication activity. And he was, let's face it, such a handsome, cool dude. <laughs> I'm all sort of David Dunger as um, the equivalent of a rock star within our British pediatric endocrine and diabetes community. I'll answer, if you like, to, to Rod Stewart. But before I start my talk, I'd like to just share with you a story that won't surprise you, but you maybe don't know. In early 2000, I was invited to join Archives of Disease in Childhood, our principal pediatric journal in the UK as an associate editor. And Harvey Markovich, the veteran editor in chief, listed his preferred reviewers. And he said that he regarded David Dunger as probably the finest reviewer the journal had. Very fair, very helpful, and always on time. And when you think, and you've heard today about how incredibly busy David was at that time and beyond and before, the fact he had time to help with other people's work, I find very, very inspiring. And every time I'm asked to review a paper, I think of Harvey Markovich's words and try to follow David's example. Well, I'm going to talk about Turner syndrome, which is a research interest that I've shared with David. And I'd like to say just a few words about the condition um, before we start. It's seen in females only, and it's due to a loss or abnormality of the second X chromosome in at least one major cell line. It is rare. And I'll come back to that. If you look at the incidence figures, only about 120 cases born every year in the UK. There's a high incidence of fetal loss so that the 3% of babies who make it to term represent, if you like, a sort of elite. Now you might think that missing all or part of a great big chromosome like the second X would be devastating. But because you switch off your second X chromosome in the cells for most tasks, actually the phenotype of Turner syndrome is remarkably mild. And I love to show this picture, which was given to me when I retired by one of my patients in, in um, 2012. For me, this is what Turner syndrome is all about. It's about ice skating and other leisure pursuits. It's making friends, going to college, training, becoming a teacher or whatever. And my vision of Turner syndrome, these should be regarded as normal girls and women, but who have more than their fair share of relatively common problems. And here they are, at least some of them. And I'm just going to focus on in interests in the top two, growth impairment and gonadal dysgenesis. Well, loss of critical genes, especially the, the shox gene from the short arm of the second X chromosome results in what we call skeletal dysplasia, where the bones are resistant to the normal levels of circulating growth factors. And this leads to impairment of all components of Karlberg's famous three curves. And as Michael Ranker, our, our next speaker has shown, Adult women with Turner syndrome who are untreated will be 20 centimeters shorter than their general population average. Also, at about five months of gestation, the human female fetus carries about 2 million eggs, and this reserve diminishes thereafter to the menopause and beyond. But in Turner syndrome, due to loss of critical genes from the second X chromosome, this process is accelerated so that by preschool age, most girls just have vestigial gonads and need replacement by estrogen at the time of puberty. Some girls go through puberty spontaneously and they are of great interest in terms of fertility preservation. 
Well, how can we help girls with Turner syndrome from these two aspects? One is to give growth promoting treatment. And secondly, is to replace estrogen at the time of puberty in girls who've got complete gonadal dyskinesis. Growth hormone is a mainstay of treatment. A daily injection of growth hormone given in double the dose to overcome the skeletal dysplasia, the double the dose for normal growth hormone deficiency, that does well for most girls. Most girls will get above 150 centimeters in height with growth hormone treatment. But some girls in all studies, no matter where you look, and that includes our data from Scotland, uh, will not do well on growth hormone. So adjunctive strategies are have been looked at. And these include use of the weak anabolic steroid oxandrolone given as a tablet alongside growth and injections, and also whether delaying pubertal induction in the girls will help them have longer in which to grow. Well, let me pause for a second to go to Glasgow, late 18, um, 18, 1989, when I went up as a senior lecturer. And Patricia Smith, who was doing the locum before I arrived, had already started taking a personal interest in girls with Turner syndrome. She docked the notes of the Turner girls to make sure that she saw them when they came to clinic. And Trisha didn't know this, but she was starting what would become the Glasgow Turner Clinic. And in 1991, we were joined by a very uh, bright um, trainee geneticist, now consultant, Carol Chu, and the Turner Clinic in Glasgow was formed. And this was the gang in 2004. The personnel have changed since then completely, but the clinic still goes on on a two monthly basis today. And in the 1990s, the research, hot research topics were, as I mentioned, oxandrolone and delay in puberty. And this is very controversial. Some people hated oxandrolone. They thought it caused clitoromegaly, voice deepening, didn't really work. Other people thought it was good in reasonable doses. Other people didn't know. And you can see from this slide the conflicting data as to oxandrolone's efficacy. Delayed puberty, delaying puberty was an even hotter topic. So you'll see from the right-hand panel that some uh, workers were suggesting delaying pubertal induction until 15 years, or as Kachari said, as long as possible. So in Glasgow, when we did the clinic, we, we formulated two research questions, which we transformed into research application to the chief scientist office in Scotland. Does Oxandro help adult height? And is it safe? Does pubertal induction at 14 versus 12 years improve adult height? For the first and the last time in my academic career, I was successful in getting money. Two years in the first instance and renewed after that. And we went down to London with our protocol and I met some very, very brainy people. We'd, we'd chosen Emma Jane Gault to be our research assistant. And I got to know better Professor Tim Cole, probably the most eminent statistician of his day in medicine, and my previous dormitory prefect, um, <laughs> dear Peter Betts from Southampton, and uh, David Dunger. And I, I knew David on the circuit for years, but I didn't realize quite how bright he was till this started. Professor Peter Highmarsh, another razor sharp intellect, and our pharmacist, Mrs. Sarah Casey. And Peter and David and Tim said to me, Malcolm, congratulations on getting the money, but this has got to be a placebo controlled randomized trial. So we gulped and spent a year putting that together and we started. And this is the recipe with growth hormone given in the conventional dose for Turner syndrome, oxandrolone given in the dosage shown, and thanks to Carol Chu, a maximum dose of 2.5 milligrams agreed, an oral synthetic estrogen induction regime over three years and progesterone added in when breakthrough bleeding occurred. And this is the structure of the study, two randomizations, one at nine years to oxandrolone or placebo, a second randomization at 12 years to either estrogen or placebo, giving estrogen to the placebo group at 14 years, and girls who enrolled after 12 years were automatically assigned to receive estrogen at 14 years. Emma Jane Galt was one of 200 applicants for the research assistant job. 
I'm sure that she is the only person of the 200 who could possibly have lasted the course with her patience, her endurance, and her persistence and her diplomacy. It was a very, very hard study. And I can't thank enough the pediatricians from small district hospitals who helped us recruit the 106 patients, 14 of whom were withdrawn very quickly because of logistic errors in registration. I also thank the 92 odd girls who stayed the course and took tablets which they well knew could be dummy or active for so many years. And by 2010, we'd had 82 girls have reached adult height, as shown, and we were able to look at our data. I shall never forget sitting in Tim Cole's office with Emma Jane in London. And for the first time, Tim, who completely blinds himself to the data, put up the growth charts, the growth curves of the patients. And we nearly fell off our chairs because there was an obvious difference between Oxandrola and the placebo. And using his then novel and actually quite well established, celebrated even, SITAR method, Tim was able to use three growth parameters to model fitted curves. And these showed unequivocally that Oxandrola increased final height by just about two inches. And interestingly, in the dosage used, none of the girls were reported to have voice deepening or clitromegaly. The results for late induction, as opposed to early induction, or one might say slightly late induction versus very late induction, were less impressive, but still clinically significant. Then uh, we published this in archives last year, we completed the study, all girls got to final height, and Tim reanalyzed the data. Oxandrolone was still highly significant in proving adult height, but by this time, delaying puberty to 40 years was having a less impressive and non-significant effect. And also by that stage, we realized that delaying puberty in girls is bad for other reasons, body image, and perhaps also uterine health. Just this slide to remind ourselves that no serious side effects were encountered with oxandrolone, and in particular, no evidence of virilization. I think this is because of the maximum dose that we had. Well, life is never simple. Judy H talked about IGF-1 being withdrawn. Halfway during the noughties, um, oxandrolone was manufactured was stopped in Europe. It's now available in America and can be used in selected cases. But there's this silly misconception that because Oxandrone isn't, it doesn't have a license that you shouldn't use it. And I'll show you what nonsense that is on the second slide. But anyway, we've shown unequivocally that Oxandrone works. And in contrast to our, date, our um, colleagues and friends from the Netherlands who didn't have a maximal dose, we show that with a, a, a maximal dose of 2.5 milligrams daily, it is, it is safe. Late pupil induction, I'm sure if you had enough girls, you would show a difference in adult height, but that difference would be modest and outweighed by the disadvantages. Yes, the only drug that we use in Turner's syndrome, ladies and gentlemen, that is licensed is growth hormone. Not estrogen, not progesterone, not patches, not pills, uh, not oxandrolin. So no reason not to use oxandrolin for that. Well, inspired by the success of, of the UK one study, we started to, su to submit bids for other studies. We wanted to compare with David Dungras, our chair of CTU. We wanted to compare oral synthetic estrogen of play, uh, induction of puberty with um, patch induction using natural estrogen. We wanted to do post-induction studies comparing oral contraceptive pill, HRT and patches in girls who'd gone through puberty. And we, we embarked on a number of grant applications, and you can read them here. And with every single one, David Dunger was, like the reviewer he was, very helpful. All the drafts were returned within 24 hours. We really did our best, and we got nowhere. And looking back at it, we were, although we didn't realize it at the time, we were on a roundabout of futility. Think about it, 2008, the financial crash, remember that? And also we've heard about diabetes, we know about cancer, we know about heart disease and stroke and, and type two diabetes and obesity. How can you possibly raise a million pounds for research into a rare condition where the girls win ice skating competitions? And, and this is one of my slightly angry slides from that era. 
So let me finish my talk by telling you what we're doing now. David knew about this, and I think um, gave it his blessing. I, I'm a member of um, the Turner Syndrome Working Group Steering Committee with our European Society for Pediatric Endocrinology, together with colleagues from other colleagues from the UK, Belgium, Netherlands, Sweden, Poland, and Italy. And we've got together and we've devised what we hope is a best practice protocol for oral pubertal induction. That is the hot topic now. That and fertility preservation are the hot topics that oxandrolone and delayed pubertal induction were in the 90s. We've devised two protocols, one oral, one transdermal, both using natural estrogen, both weight-based. And we published this in Hormone Research a couple of years ago. I simply want you to take away for this uh, oral Dutch derived protocol that the doses of estradiol are based on body weight, which if you think about it is pretty logical. And for the patch regime, this involves cutting patches of different sizes, again, according to body weight for years one, two, three, and then the final adult year. And what we propose is that clinicians all over Europe and beyond invite their families with Turner syndrome to choose either our preferred oral or our preferred transdermal protocols, and to agree to data, anonymized data, before induction at the end of each of the three years to be entered onto the international DSD, IDSD platform created by my friend and colleague from Glasgow, Professor Faisal Ahmed. As we speak, a specific platform for Turner syndrome is, is being created. And we hope that clinicians will enroll their families, put the data onto the ITS platform, so that with prospective data collection, data sharing, we can look at outcomes according to oral and transdermal therapy, including acceptability and compliance, which have never been looked at, uh, in a way that will help us help our patients in the future. I'd like to end up with my acknowledgement slide. Um, and particularly thanks to Vicky and to Ken for their great help in organizing this meeting. I'd like to end up with a quote from David made in the, in the mid 2000s. He said, I would like to see every child and adolescent with a defined endocrine condition enrolled into a clinical trial. He had the vision that if you had an overactive thyroid, an underactive thyroid, early puberty and so on, there would be trials going on, like there are for leukemia, and we know what they've done to improve care, that would be ongoing. Now, in today's financial climate, I think randomized clinical trials in niche specialties probably aren't realistic, but I do hope that our data, prospective data collection, data sharing and comparison between disciplined protocols will be a way forward. And if we can get this to work for Turner syndrome, then we can get it to work for other paediatric endocrine conditions, and hopefully other rare paediatric disorders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm, for sharing that story about a long, long journey of trying to optimize treatment in children with Turner syndrome. And thank you for sharing a personal reflection of uh, David and David's wider contribution to endocrinology. And that nicely leads to our next talk by Professor Michael Ranke. And Professor Ranke is an Emeritus Head of Department, University of Tübingen. Uh, uh, Professor Ranke evaluated response to growth hormone in a uh, series of publication using the large KICS database. And he used very complex mathematical models to evaluate growth. David was very much interested in it, and David was also very keen that our tra his trainees should understand that as well, which was not always very easy. So this is a recorded talk, and I welcome my Professor Michael, thank you. Hello, Bayard, Lady Jane Roberts, your colleagues and friends. With great sadness did I receive the information about the demise of David Dunger, our admired pediatric endocrinologist and highly estimated friend. I thank the organizers of this meeting for the honor of being part of this congregation memorizing David, the person and his work. When I think of David, I always had a picture like this of him in mind. A warm and friendly man, 
observing others with his sharp intellect, but at the same time showing a critical distance to matters. He was not to be fooled by the spirit of times and went his own ways. Certainly he did not try to impress his audience by wearing a bow tie. I think that I noticed David's name for the first time when I was invited as a representative of young aspiring German pediatricians to the annual meeting of the British Pediatric Society in York in 1980. David won the accompanying golf competition. The applause when this achievement was announced indicated that this competition was one of the real highlights of the meeting. I actually talked about DHAA, a theme that became more relevant in David's great scientific theme, the, the SGA in newborn. Later, our group shared several joint projects and uh, publications, as you can see, several on growth hormone, IGFs, SGA, and diabetes mellitus. Well, the organizers of this symposium suggested that my contribution today should be a little lecture on growth hormone and KIGS, which was also one of the many interests of David. I wonder what David would have said to this choice. He would probably have given a critical look as usual. Well, let me shortly introduce my topics to you. As we all know, Morris Rabin from Boston is quoted to be the first to treat a growth hormone deficient patient successfully with cadaveric human pituitary growth hormone. This era of pituitary growth hormone lasted for almost 30 years and stopped sharply uh, due to the kreuzfeldt -Jakob, jakob crisis. During these years, the important IGF field also emerged. By 1979, the new genetic allowed to synthesize recombinant human growth hormone, which was first marketed in 1985 in the US and later outside by the small Swedish company Carvi, which is now incorporated into the giant Pfizer Corporation. Definitely, this is growth. What is KICS? In short, first, after the approval of the new Carby recombinant growth hormone product, the authorities demanded to follow another 500 growth hormone deficient children over five years. Second, since the enthusiasm about the potential use of the new growth hormone was so great after five years, 5,000 cases have been documented into the um, study. And third, the newly developed international multicenter, expert-driven, democratically structured survey and registry termed KIGS, Carby International Growth Study, in 2003 termed Pfizer International Growth Database. And four, the goals of KICS were to assess the long-term safety and efficacy of human recombinant growth hormone and to use all the collected information from KICS for an improvement in the field of growth. Well, the disadvantages of such a survey are obvious. Information is voluntary, methods are not standardized, no controls, etc. The level of generated evidence is thus only moderate. But there are also advantages. Very large numbers, long-term information, variability of intervention, etc. And as always, it is the quality of the dealing with the data and the quality of the analysis which determine the results. As can be seen, over 35 years of the existence of KIGS was active in 52 countries and documented over 83,000 cases during over more than 275,000 patient years and remarkably included patients with about 150 different diagnoses. Well, what was the outcome in terms of adverse events? The KICS investigators were obliged to document any adverse events, irrespective of possible cause. This resulted 
in reporting mostly common infections and the like, which occurred in about 15% of all patients. But in 3.1% the observed adverse events were considered to be causal to treatment. However, this was based on the judgment of the investigators and treating physicians and not externally controlled. This is the fundamental problem with, within surveys like Higgs of the overall 703 deaths reported, only 26 were considered treatment related. It is obvious that the Higgs system was not very suited to produce high levels of evidence in, in, in information on safety of recombinant growth hormone. But I think this is not much worse than, for example, in the most discussed Saga survey. However, overall, Higgs supported the cumulated evidence that recombinant human growth hormone given daily and in the current doses is actually safe. Well, the situation looks much better with regard to the results derived on efficacy. We all know that the response to growth hormone here on the left in more than 800 idiopathic growth hormone deficient patients during the first prepubertal year on growth hormone expressed in terms of centimeters per year varies a lot. This poses the question what the appropriate response in an individual should be. We have learned, also in the middle, that the response per dose unit, the responsiveness, depends on the diagnosis of the treated individuals. In our example, it is the best in growth hormone deficiency, less good in SGA, and worst in Turner syndrome. Thus, on the right, the response is dependent on the patient's condition, diagnosis, age, sex, height, etc., likely also on genetic and metabolic makeup, and depending on the chosen treatment conditions, the year of treatment, the dose, and the frequency of injections. It was actually only a small conceptual step to conclude that information gathered from Higgs patients could be used to develop mathematical algorithms for the calculation, prediction so to say, of the most likely response to be expected in an individual to growth hormone treatment. This was done for the first prepubertal year. First prepubertal year for growth hormone deficiency, Turner syndrome, and SGA. And in principle, in growth hormone deficiency, the degree of growth hormone deficiency determines the first year response the most. Contrasting in many other non-growth hormone deficiency diagnoses as Turner syndrome and FCA, it is a dose which is the most important predictor during the first year. You can see this here. I don't want to go into the detail. But after the first prepubertal year, and we have studied the second to the eighth prepubertal years, the situation is rather uniform. You can see this here. For the diagnosis investigated, the response observed in the year of treatment before always becomes the most important predictor. Thus, when you are a good responder to growth hormone, you will continue to be so, and vice versa. During puberty, as you see on the right, matters are a little bit more complicated, and I don't want to go into it. In, in detail. Well, thus, with the algorithm developed for different diagnoses and stages of treatment, one can calculate it for an individual the expected response, a mean with an error range. Look for reasons if observed and predicted responses differ, and finally also design treatment from start to end. With the help of many experts, based on the validated knowledge, an IT system, the IGRO Individualized Growth Response Optimization, was developed usable for all daily injectable brands. I can give you an example. I mean, this boy on the left is a severely growth hormone deficient boy. As you can see down here, he is very short. 
He was treated with growth hormone, as you can see uh, on this, this line. And for unknown reasons, of course, the, in, the investigator decided to reduce the growth hormone dose during puberty. And the result, in terms of outcome, is that there was a nice catch-up, but eventually the boy with a height target of 174 centimeters only reached 158 centimeters. And that needs to be seen in the context of the growth hormone used. Obviously, the boy should have been given growth hormone in sufficient amounts during puberty. And the example that I'm showing to you is that an elevated dose of growth hormone was given over the four years of puberty. And what is the result? When the predicted result is the boy will reach a height of 165 centimeters. But when you add all the amount of growth hormone that he was given, the dose was actually doubled if you do this. But you can perhaps go another way. This is the same boy that you have seen. And for the sake of the example, one can also add the amount of growth hormone, a higher dose of growth during the first prepubertal years of treatment. And we will see what happens. The boy shows a nice catch-up within the normal uh, range and eventually reaches a height of 170 centimeters. The amount of growth hormone given is about the same as in the previous example when you added growth hormone during puberty. But that is a good investment. And the conclusion is puberty is obviously not a very good time to um, uh, um, correct growth deficits. Well, that example looks quite nice. But what was David's view to kicks in growth hormone? David was interested in the new future directions of growth hormone treatment and the growth prediction models concept from the very beginning. He considered the principle of deriving treatment strategies from empirical data in developing algorithms as an important approach in modern medicine. But it took him a while to become directly involved in the kick structures. But when he did, he made major contributions within the Executive Scientific Committee for several years. For example, for further refinement and the prediction models, he saw also the potential for an easily available IT system, which I just talked about, and the need to incorporate modern metabolomics and genomics. And several papers resulted with David's input. But coming to the end of the short note, as it looks, we are leaving the area of daily injectable recombinant um, human growth hormone for the emerging long-acting growth hormone variants. In the 2022 issue of Endo News, the somewhat populistic tabloid of the American Endocrine Society, it reads, in 2015, the Growth Research Society recognized the need for long-acting therapies as decreasing the frequency of injections could lead to adherence and better outcomes. According to a recent report from Global Data, whatever that is, long-acting growth hormones are projected to capture more than 90% of the market share by 2030. This poses questions. Which will be the remaining lessons from the various surveys conducted with authentic daily injected recombinant human growth hormone given for various indications, such as gig? Or will there be similar or improved long-term surveys conducted with long-acting growth hormone like gigs? And what would David have said? I do not know, but likely he would have lauded Douglas Fraser in the United States, pediatric endocrinologist, an independent special character for his quote. Davis, Douglas Fraser wrote in 1997 about the pituitary human growth hormone era, quote, while the not so good old days are gone and need not to be lamented, 
there remains virtue in a conservative therapeutic philosophy. If anything can be learned from the use of pituitary growth hormone in children, it is a healthy respect for the law of unintended consequences. I think this also is relevant for the time today. And this is the end of my little contribution. I thank you very much for listening. And I must say, I will miss David really a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ranke, uh, for giving us an overview of uh, short hormone treatment in children and King's, da King's database. And it rather highlights uh, David's role in multinational collaborations and wider contribution to pediatric endocrinology. I'd like to invite Ken to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, AJ. Next, I'm uh, re delighted to introduce a colleague of ours in, in, in Cambridge, uh, Dr. Rachel Williams. Uh, Rachel is a, a fellow uh, consultant pediatric endocrinologist and uh, diabet diabetologist in the Western Center here, and uh, also a associate clinical professor in Nottingham. Now she manages to uh, do uh, everything is amazing. Um, and I've known Rachel for many years, since the early 2000s, uh, when we were uh, research fellows on, on level eight, together with uh, uh, Rakesh Amin, uh, Tero Saukanen. Um, and uh, yes, we had many uh, enjoyable years together. Um, and uh, Rachel is uh, the, the clinical lead for severe insulin resistance in, in, in the pediatric service in Cambridge. Um, so Rachel, hopefully we can see, see you there. Um, invite you to give your talk. Hey, can I just check you can hear me okay? That looks great, thank you. Okay, thanks Ken for that very kind uh, introduction uh, and good afternoon everyone. Um, so as Ken said, um, I'm now a consultant in pediatric endocrinology here in Cambridge and I work with David in various capacities um, starting from 2000, when I came as a very a much younger and greener research fellow uh, to Level 8, uh, where I worked with um, other research fellows that Ken has already outlined, uh, and with Carlo Acciarini. What Ken didn't allude to is that he was the SPSS guru uh, of our office, and all of us learned pretty much everything we know about statistics from him. Later on, I became a clinical lecturer and finally worked with David as a consultant colleague. Over the years, I learned a huge amount from David, as we all did. His drive to extract all possible understanding from every situation was second to none, and he was always curious, and that is something that I will always take with me. I also learned how to do power calculations for physiological studies that resulted in a sample size of 12 every time. <laughs> um, and how to, um, I think it's fair to say that David's ability to um, shoehorn research into a limited budget was, was also second to none. So I learned many, many things, not least a thorough grounding in science. Um, and I'm hugely grateful uh, to have been part of the team that David shaped uh, and that was fondly referred to as the Dungarees by our then level eight administrator, Linda. Um, and in preparing this talk, I actually found some slides that David and I had put together for a meet the professor session at one of the endocrine society meetings back in, I think, 2016. And I'm sure many of us will also remember David's ability to constantly adjust the slides right up until the final second um, of, be before the talk. And actually, that's something that I found myself doing just this morning, uh, endlessly tweaking. Um, so, yeah, his, his, his legacy lives on. Um, many of you will know that most of the work I did with David was around the manipulation of the growth hormone IGF-1 axis in type 1 diabetes, but today I'm going to talk about the rationale for the therapeutic use of IGF-1, arguably, as we've heard, David's favourite protein in syndromes of severe insulin resistance. This work really rate relates to only a handful of patients, um, and uh, as I've been reflecting on this talk, I think it provides really a uh, good contrast of, of David's footprint, if you like, of um, work from epidemiology to large cohort studies to type 1 diabetes 
but also to very, very tiny numbers of very rare patients. So I'm just going to briefly um, contextualize uh, this. There are a number of different causes of severe insulin resistance. Uh, so the partial or total absence of fat, lipodystrophy, and insulin signaling defects, plus a collection of other much rarer syndromes. And today I'm going to uh, be talking largely about uh, those uh, conditions where there's reduced insulin signaling, um, as, we, as we generally use leptin, um, where severe, severe insulin resistance is second to lipodystrophy. So these are really rare conditions with awful severe phenotypes generally. Um, and for David, I think this allowed an opportunity to seek to understand the physiology in more detail using these phenotypes, but also to offer a potential treatment to a small group of patients for whom there arguably are no effective therapies. So the most severe condition or the most severe phenotype is um, known now as Donahue syndrome. Um, and this is still lethal, um, and it's, it, it, there's almost no effective treatment. Um, moving down, we have Rabson-Mendenhall syndrome. So the, the natural history of, the, of, the, of this condition is really to um, develop uh, diabetes again, where, where there's no real effective treatment, um, and often these patients will survive only into their mid-20s. And then moving down um, in type A insulin resistance, this is where there's one copy of the insulin receptor, uh, which is a variant. Um, and these mainly cause problems, as you can see here, huge cosmetic problems with severe acanthosis, nigricans, hirsutism, and also diabetes. Um, and as endocrinologists, it's often, we don't have that many untreatable conditions, I think. Oh, um, that's, that's often something which is in, the, the portfolio of other clinicians. So these are particularly difficult. So where does IGF-1 come in um, as a rationale or an alternative? So we've heard from Julie already about the use of IGF-1 in type 1 diabetes to reduce growth hormone hypersecretion. However, when there's a primary problem with, with signaling via the insulin receptor, IGF-1, which has structural homology to the insulin protein, but also has its own distinct receptor, offers an alternative um, signaling pathway. As you can appreciate, there are very limited data, and given the rarity of these conditions, we will never have the, uh, the advantage of large randomized control trials in these patients. So, we were involved um, with the care of two sisters with Rabson Mendenhall syndrome, and these patients were shared with Modidi. Um, and these two girls were um, in the into late childhood and, uh, and early adolescence when, when I first met them. And they had very poor diabetes control on very high doses of mixed insulins, which they gave very they actually they used to, they were very open about the fact that. Why would you give a therapy? It just doesn't work. Um, and they both had quite severe uh, acanthosis nigricans. Um, and I thought there's been a bit of a depressing absence of physiology, uh, but this is just OGTT data from one of, one of the siblings. And what, what you can see is in the open squares, um, pre-treatment and the, the closed squares, uh, post-treatment with IGF-1 for 18 months. And what you can see, I hope, is that there was a reduction um, in glucose concentrations and also a reduction in insulin concentrations um, with, with IGF-1 treatment. Um, there were similar outcomes in both girls. There were also reductions in HbA1c, and both of them actually were very open about the fact that they didn't mind giving the IGF-1 because it helped with their skin. So they both had very, very uh, severe acanthosis nigricans and were, were very pleased that it had helped with that. Um, and this is... Um, probably one of the only papers in, in this area. And again, so um, this was looked at using uh, IGF-1 in complex with its binding protein, IGF-BP3. Uh, uh, it's no longer available, but it was uh, known as uh, somatokine. And the hope was that by complexing it to its binding program, it would uh, increase the half-life and meant that it would only need to be given once daily. And this was a study that was uh, um, primarily done by Fiona Regan. Um, and again, very small numbers, uh, five patients, and I think we think only four of them actually uh, had reasonably good adherence to IGF-1. 
And it's important to note uh, that um, only that two of these five patients were known to have insulin receptor variations and in single copy, and the cause was unknown in the other three. All of the um, patients um, reported improvements in acanthosis ni ni nigra cans and some subjective reductions in hirsutism, although we didn't score that formally as part of the study protocol. And that's just shown here. Again, you can see this is classic, David, I think, you know, kind of just try, trying to explore all avenues at every opportunity just to see what we can glean uh, from, from, the, from, from the studies. Um, so I think this slide summarises it really. So this is just HbA1c before and after in all of those five subjects. And you can see that in some of them, so for example, this one, uh, it worked really, really well. Um, and it, it, the ones in whom there was the greatest effect were the two that had the known variations in their insulin receptor. Um, and the assumption is, although we didn't know that at the time, is that in the other patients where the causes were unknown, that if there was a problem within the intracellular signaling pathway, and there's often commonality between the insulin receptor and the type 1 IGF receptor, um, that, that, that actually IGF-1 might, may not have been so helpful in, in those patients. Um, but again, when it works, as you can see here, I hope, from the CGM trace um, before and after, um, actually, it has really quite remarkable effects in patients for whom there is really very little else by way of intervention. Um, so this um, is part of that legacy, really. So in Cambridge, we run a national um, severe insulin resistance service that uh, David and Steve O'Reilly, who um, really was their vision, uh, to provide a clinical service for children and adults with these extremely rare syndromes. And we're a single centre um, which provide clinical and research expertise. And there's very much a lot of interplay and discussion um, between those two um, environments. And the environment is very rich in which to deliver, deliver patient care and also inform the science. Um, there's an expert MDT. And now we have about 35 children and young people on our books um, and we deliver much multidisciplinary care. This is an old slide, actually. The rest of the team has moved on quite a bit, but I wanted to have uh, one with, with David on it. So, And we've heard a great deal today that David was an effective and passionate cl clinician dedicated to the delivery of excellent patient care, in addition to his drive and thirst for scientific understanding. And I think, for me, this particular area demonstrates that, working so hard to improve things for very small numbers of patients. And today, as of today, there are three young people in the UK uh, treated with IGF-1 for their absent Mendenhall syndrome. Um, so these are the acknowledgement slides. I'm bound to have forgotten some people. Um, and I just want to finish with this photograph. I think it's already been up already. Um, but much of David's work was supported by Angie, um, who also sadly passed away uh, earlier this year. Um, and those of us who remember the inevitable overnight profiles, which preceded all of the kind of uh, fancy physiology, we all had to stay up all night um, trying to keep the blood glucose at, at, at five. Um, we're always grateful for the sight of Angie winning in a trolley in the mornings. And I've got many fond memories of David and Angie enjoying a cigarette together. And so I wanted to finish with this photograph. Thanks, Clive, for sharing it with me. Um, and that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for a really fabulous talk. I remember um, the David uh, managing a, a patient in Oxford. I remember in my first years as a uh, research fellow, a uh, little baby with a severe insulin uh, receptor gene defect, um, Donahue syndrome, and the baby sadly uh, passed away after a, a, only a, a few weeks. And uh, I was struck by just how sad David was and how frustrated he was that uh, uh, he couldn't do anything for it while the insulin receptor really was uh, uh, was damaged. He knew that there was an IGF receptor that could be signaled and the IGF one was, was, wasn't available at that time. And just, I was struck also by uh, Julie Edge's talk, how he just moved by often sort of individual patients and situations that he could make a difference and uh, that work has led to you know that the, the availability of, uh, of, of IGF-1 in those extreme cases but also the setting up of the, the national commission service for severe insulin resistance that, uh, uh, that I say Rachel 
uh, leads on the, on the pediatric side. So really sort of amazing uh, legacy that he's left. So thank you uh, for that, Rachel. Um, our next uh, speak, speaker is uh, uh, Francis de Zega, and also on behalf of uh, Lourdes Imenez. Francis de Zega is, uh, uh, was, was a founding chair of, uh, in, in the Department of Women's and Children in, in, in Leuven, and uh, Lourdes Imenez is the chair of pediatrics in, in Barcelona. And over many years, since the late 1990s, we've worked uh, collaborated closely with them and they have really led some of the most elegant studies in physiology and treatment uh, of, of SGA growth and reproductive outcomes uh, in, in pediatric endocrinology and so yeah look forward to hear it their their talk Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for honoring Lourdes and me with the kind invitation to speak here today. If June 6 is D-Day, then June 24 could become David Day or Dunger Day here in Cambridge. DD Day would be an alternative or DBD Day or DBD 25 Day. As always with David, there is an abundance of possibilities. Today we will remind you of a simple concept about matches and mismatches in the lifetime of each of us. In early life, healthy individuals manage to establish a match between prenatal adipogenesis and postnatal lipogenesis. In other words, they manage to establish a match between the early capacity to store lipids and the later demand to store lipids. In daily practice, a helpful tool is to check whether there is a match between prenatal weight gain and postnatal weight gain. One way of expressing this match is to show the centile of birth weight and to compare it to the centile of BMI in childhood or adolescence. And when those centiles are around the same level, then there tends to be an endocrine and metabolic balance. Even when birth weight is low, there are usually no problems as long as the subsequent BMI remains also in the low range. However, when there is an upward mismatch, then endocrine and metabolic problems tend to emerge, presumably because more fat has to be stored than is safely feasible. One way to escape from an upward mismatch is to have a very high birth weight. And this is the background for one of David's famous sentences. If your birth weight is above 10 pounds, then you live forever. Let's now illustrate the mismatch concept with a few examples. This figure shows DHEAS levels at age 8 years by turtile of birth weight and by turtile of weight at 8 years. And as you know, DHEAS is released by the inner zone of the adrenal cortex. The highest levels are in children with the lower birth weight and a higher weight in childhood. So the phenomenon of adrenarchy is exaggerated or accelerated in the children with the biggest mismatch. The pattern turns out to be essentially the same for fasting insulin, for IGF-1, for ectopic fat and even for systolic and diastolic blood pressure. 
and the highest values are observed in the children with the biggest mismatch. Let's now have a look inside the pediatric endocrine clinic, more specifically in the clinic of girls with accelerated maturation. An upward mismatch between pre- and postnatal weight gain has been observed in a majority of girls with rapid maturation. Here you see the centiles of weight at birth and BMI at diagnosis in three cohorts of girls with precocious pubarchy, thus in girls with an appearance of pubic hair before the age of eight years. These results were obtained in countries as diverse as Australia, Finland and Spain. And today's message is that 20 years ago we were already working on a treatment for these mismatched girls, in particular for those who had a rather low weight at birth and who were not obese in childhood. Indeed, together with David and Ken, we explored the effects of metformin treatment in such girls with precocious pubarchy. A metformin treatment was accompanied by a more normal timing of puberty, by more normal concentrations of circulating IGF-1, and by a less adipose body composition, in particular by less abdominal fat. Let's now move to precocious puberty. And the middle panel shows the mismatch in three cohorts of girls with precocious puberty, thus in girls with breast development before the age of eight years. Again, today's message is that 20 years ago, we were already working on a treatment for these mismatched girls, in particular for those who had a rather low weight at birth and who were not obese in childhood. Actually, we explored the effects of metformin in low birth weight girls with an early normal onset of puberty, thus in girls who were not eligible for a treatment with a GnRH analog. A metformin intervention was accompanied by a less adipose body composition, by a less advanced timing of menarche, and ultimately by more height gain so that adult stature was more normal. Finally, let's move to polycystic ovary syndrome. The right panel shows the centiles in three cohorts of adolescent girls or young women with PCOS from countries on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. And again, today's message is that 20 years ago, we were already working on a treatment for these mismatched girls, in particular for those who had a rather low weight at birth and who were not obese in adolescence. Actually, we explored the effects of metformin early after menarche and found that it prevents progression from precocious pubarchy to PCOS. The metformin results are shown in black dots and, as you see, there were favorable effects on circulating testosterone, on LDL and HDL cholesterol, on truncal and body fat mass, and on lean body mass. In those days, we were quite excited about all these results, but many physicians did not like the idea of treating adolescent girls with metformin, which was then not approved for any pediatric indication. Our metformin papers ended up in relatively low journals and they received relatively few citations. In 2012, gynecologists were still prescribing oral contraceptives to adolescent girls with PCOS and we asked David for his opinion while walking 
together in Little St. Mary's Lane here in Cambridge. The question was, David, our metformin work is not receiving many citations. Are we too far behind or too far ahead? And within seconds, David replied that we were too far ahead, maybe 10 years. So here we are, 10 years later, in 2022. Nowadays, Lourdes and I are testing the effects of Spiomet in adolescent girls with PCOS. Spiomet is a low-dose combination of three old and safe genetics, namely spironolactone, pioglitazone and metformin. Spiomet is known to activate brown adipose tissue, to double adiponectinemia and to triple the concentrations of circulating GDF15 in these girls. And here you see that an oral contraceptive, OC, has no lowering effect on liver fat and that Spiomet lowers it towards normal as indicated by the dotted line. The effects of Spiomet did extend beyond active treatment and they did so without changing body weight. We observed also that liver fat associated closely to post-treatment ovulation rate. The annualized post-treatment number of ovulations was nearly threefold higher after Spiomet than after OC treatment. In the next years, Spiomet will be tested further in a large project that is based in Barcelona funded by the European Union and endorsed by the European Medicines Agency. In summary, we will perform a multicenter double-blind phase 2b trial in early PCOS. The effects of lifestyle changes will be explored and there will be four treatment arms. Primary endpoint will be ovulation rate, as judged by weekly progesterone in saliva. And key results are expected in 2025 or 2026. In conclusion, it may not be true that if your birth weight is very high, you live forever. However, it may be true that if your creativity is very high, you do live forever. Thank you, David, and we thank you for the kind attention. Thank you, Francis and Lourdes, uh, again, for a, a really great talk. And uh, it's been yeah, it's a great honor to be in, involved in, the, uh, in, in this work as well. Um, as I said, it's grown from uh, very uh, clear um, focus models in, in, in uh, patients with uh, low birth weight, SGA, uh, early puberty, uh, and, and uh, insulin resistance in the absence of overweight and extending those, uh, uh, what's, those messages, that those lessons now to much wider groups of patients with uh, adolescent PCOS and uh, early onsets of, of, of puberty. Uh, it's also a great example that our, David you know, tremendously valued your, your, your friendship and uh, uh, many collaborators in, in, in Europe but always uh, look forward to meeting with uh, uh, Francis and, and Lourdes and my, one of my personal highlights I remember after the Endocrine Society in uh, Toronto in 2000 having a, a, a delightful afternoon sailing on Lake Ontario uh, with David and Lourdes and Francis and it was, I remember that because it was one week before my wedding 
and I came back with a wonderful suntan and uh, trouble persuading my wife that I really had been away uh, working. So, so glad you could uh, contribute and, and, and join, join us. So we'll have a short break. We'll start again at uh, half past two. So we'll have 10 minutes and look forward to uh, you joining us again then. Meeting. For our final session, I'm going to hopefully hand over to Rachel Williams to introduce the next speaker. Yes, um, thanks, Ken. Um, so it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome Professor Shane Norris, uh, Director of the MRC uh, WITS Development um, Pathways for Health Research Unit and also Research Professor, Department of Pediatrics, uh, University of the Witwatersrand. Rant. So Shane, uh, you're very welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm just gonna quickly get my presentation up and share my screen. Great, great presentation view. Fantastic, excellent. Well, firstly, many thanks for the invitation to present today. I'm deeply honored to be able to reflect on my, my working time with David and the immense impact he's had on not only my work, but on many individuals in South Africa and students he's co-supervised with me. So I want to talk a little bit about David um, as the mentor and particularly a, a critical mentor in my academic um, career progression. I was very fortunate to have met David back in 2006 um, and actually 2005 when we began working on a Wellcome Trust postdoctoral fellowship and which started in 2007. And literally since 2007 to date, um, there's not been a single year we've not worked collaboratively on a research grant. And it literally progressed from that Wellcome Trust postdoctoral fellowship all the way through to a joint global health trials grant, which is the current grant we have. And it's been an incredible um, collaborative journey and experience for me, which has you know, added hugely to my own career and progression and the science that we've done together. David, and his trips to South Africa, he became a master of the short trip. Um, it was quite phenomenal. He would literally arrive the Saturday morning. So work full time on the Friday, get onto a plane, get into South Africa the Saturday. And we'd have two days with him, Saturday and Sunday, basically. And Sunday night, he'd be off and back at work on Monday morning. Um, but actually, remarkably how taxing it must have been his focus and to give two days of solid time was absolutely incredible for myself and the team and we managed to achieve so much so these short trips became a big part of how we engaged over the years and as several have already mentioned and one of the, the key learnings for me is the art of a good diagram and notes. Um, in preparation for this talk and going through some slides and documents, I've got literally a massive file of all David's notes and diagrams and designs um, through the years that we progressed through the various studies. He was always the teacher um, in direct and indirect ways. What was remarkable was that there wasn't a single missed opportunity to inform or to teach. I remember one aspect I learned very early on while as a postdoc with David is how incredibly up to date he was with the literature. And in a way, he kind of constantly tested one by always saying, oh, have you read so-and-so in this journal? Did you see what they found? And his subtle dismay if, you, if, you, if he got the sense that, no, you hadn't seen it yet. So in much of my preparation for David was to make sure I kept abreast with the literature. And in fact, it became a little bit of a game between us in the sense of who could 
outsmart one each other by referencing a paper that's just come out that the other hadn't read. So fun times around that. Another critical component of learning was this balance between impatience and program development. David, on one hand, was incredibly impatient and got frustrated when we didn't get what he wanted us to get and we couldn't get it into field. But at the same time, he appreciated the fact that for some instances, one had to forgo impatience and really develop a program of work to build the evidence, build the case for the study that we eventually wanted to do. And the study that I'll kind of end with in this talk which is really a kind of culmination of 12 years of work. And that is this really almost duality of having the idea in so many years in advance, but recognizing the time it takes to eventually get to that. And finally, he really, for us, set the bar high. Um, he demanded a high standard in terms of engagement around the science, the output that was presented, and the opportunities um, for the research team. And for many of the students that he supervised with me and, um, and folks that he engaged with on the South African side, they will always comment on the value that he had and the input he had um, on their development, but on this idea of setting the bar high as a standard to work towards. And as I kind of alluded to and, and several others have as well, um, this incredible ability, almost this kind of science, science magician that could pluck ideas out of the ether and put it forward that is was way ahead of the field. And so it was thrilling to be part of that, part of those processes of idea generation. And also then the kind of frustration that came with it in that it was often totally discordant for where the funders were. And then it took so long eventually to get a funder to back the study and invest in it. And I remember um, very fondly time we spent in Umeå in Sweden with a, a group of South African researchers, David and Swedish colleagues. And at that stage, we were forging forward with the idea of preconception intervention. And we were writing a concept note for the Gates Foundation during our time um, together in Umeå. And we put it together really excited um, and thought it was really cutting edge. And this was in 2000 and submitted it to Gates. Clearly they didn't like it, didn't fund it. And now almost 12 years later, they now have a program of work investing exactly in that area of science. So, you know, that's what I think we had to learn is that you've got to get the idea and then slowly chip and chip and chip away at it and eventually it comes to comes to fruition and gets funded. And so with David's support, uh, we developed three big programs of work um, in South Africa. One was this notion of intergenerational risk and uh, took two arms to that. One was preconception, thinking of the preconception period for adolescents and youth in particular and how to build up an evidence base and an argument to focus and focus and intervene in that life course stage. Similarly, in pregnancy, he was fascinated with um, gestational diabetes, um, and particularly within the South African context, given the high level of obesity that women would um, be at by the time they presented a booking at the antenatal um, clinic. So a significant program of work, and we conducted the largest survey um, to determine the prevalence of GDM in South Africa and conducted multiple different studies um, to unpack that and understand it more on both the consequences in, la in later life. Um, we also examined infant growth and later obesity, hypertension, diabetes risk, and you've, you've heard some of his interests that have overlaid in other populations around this in his work with Ken. 
um, and then set up several physiological mechanisms. In a way, from a cascade of, of work, we've made good progress on the EPI and now in the trials. Um, and in a way, that's the, form, the foundation for the physiological studies, which will certainly continue. Um, but for me, a bit sad that he's not going to see that realization um, as part of the work and the investment he's made into the team in South Africa. So going through some slides, um, this was a slide back in 2009 that um, intrigued David hugely and was part of um, a process we were engaging around of how to set up the argument for this investment in this kind of intergenerational um, thinking to offset chronic disease in later life. And um, so this was quite fascinating. It was produced by the World Bank in 2009. And I just included it because this was a kind of forecast of what the problems the world would face. And it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, certainly it highlighted as big areas was, which caught our attention was this chronic disease, which you can see in this big red, solid red um, box here. And what it was really, what they were putting forward was that chronic disease, the likelihood and the severity of which would be phenomenally increased and would be a major problem the world would face. And in fact, that was partly the argument of why we use this in several grant applications. But just for interest's sake, it was interesting that back then, infectious disease, even though as we know other, that in most cases, infectious disease burden was coming down, it does show how things can change. And COVID has certainly shown us how um, infectious disease can't be ruled out. So since 2007, we've been massing lots of data and examining it. And I'm just gonna show some very simple, uh, more descriptive epi slides, just to kind of show you the argument and the things that intrigued David that um, pushed some of the ideas forward. Um, this is data collected in a rural area with our partners, Steve and Tolman and Kathy Kahn in Ashencourt. And this was the first one of the first PhDs students anchored to this program of work with David. And here we collected a lot of growth data cross-sectionally, um, but at different ages. And, in, and literally it was from age one all the way to 20. But just in the, the key thing to note here is that this was the mean BMI in the population. The values and all of this was meaningless for David, but what he really, really picked up on was this distribution that you had quite a large number above the, the mean line as well as below. And this kind of notion of double burden became a, a double burden of malnutrition became a key area and, and fed into some of the ideas. Not surprising that in the kind of latter years um, in this rural population, we, we already have a high level of, of overweight and obesity by 20, central adiposity, um, and this kind of um, inching up of diabetes risk um, that, you know, in a, in a young population, there was a, at that point in time, a fairly high level of impaired fasting glucose. Within the birth to 20 and now the birth to 30 cohort, we examined the longitudinal growth trajectories. And this one, um, I remember was one of, the, during my postdoc was one of, uh, well, just after my postdoc actually, was one of the first um, um, graphs that I, I drew as part of a, a part of a study that we've just got some funding for. And we had just finished um, data collection in birth to 20, 20 now at the end of that. And we kind of looked at the longitudinal. So this is true longitudinal growth. And I'll come back to this blip here in the early years. But really what intrigued us was that by nine, the significant divergence in um, BMI Z score was occurring between the sexes with the females moving upwards and the males moving down and eventually trickling out to a level and then slowly rising um, in the early 20s. Um, so again, this was kind of um, noting an, an important trajectory pattern um, that would drive some of our questions. 
Going back to the earlier phase, um, we examined as many did and as Ken was doing in the, on the Cambridge side, this aspect of um, infant and childhood um, growth in terms of um, linear growth and rapid weight gain. We examined in that period also what was seen as a kind of transient catch-up weight gain, that you had this catch-up weight gain between birth and one year, and then typically this was not just seen in birth to 20, but has been seen in other um, South African cohorts. Um, but then the major growth faltering in linear growth occurring between one and two. But this kind of transient catch-up weight, um, we kind of modeled with later data, and it was associated with earlier menarche by six months and greater adiposity, almost six by six kilograms heavier in um, that group um, by the time they were in early adulthood. Um, we we're also very fortunate to have longitudinal DEXA body composition data. And in this over here, we've got fat mass on the Y and velocity of fat mass on the Z and um, years from um, adult peak height velocity on the X axis. The purple is normal weight of um, the adolescents at, at young adulthood. And the green is those that were already obese at that point. And we've used this kind of sitar, well, this analysis with sitar analysis and latent growth um, analysis, looking at the adolescent period in terms of what was driving it from early growth, how did the adolescent period impact um, diabetes, hypertension, obesity risk in later adulthood. But what was interesting here was that around the kind of three years post um, adult peak height, you had the peak in um, fat mass. Um, and so it was an accumulation of that to that period. And that again showed us that this, this, this earlier, this is, could be this window of opportunity for adolescent girls where one could start shifting some of these trajectories and reduce the risk. So much of the observational epidemiology work showed the complex burden. Um, so still the persistence of undernutrition, but this emergence of greater overweight and obesity risk, even transgenerate intergenerationally. Um, and we start, we saw that with, you know, kind of the level of stunting as well as the level of overweight and obesity in children. Obviously, in the older adult profile, you've got all the classic non-communicable diseases um, at levels that are really significant and putting a significant burden on the health system. So actually, South Africa gave David an opportunity to get involved in more public health related interventions. And so this accumulation of work really landed into this case whereby we saw adolescent and youth pregnancies potentially complicated by two pathways. One was the more obesity, GDM, macrosomia. The other one was low maternal BMI, poor fetal growth, low birth weight, both of which conferring um, risk in later life for type two diabetes. And so from a public health point of view, what could we do to offset that potential um, life course risk? And that's really, where we at at the moment. So lots of formative work, and I'm not gonna go into all that detail, but literally 12 years of it. And we finally got the preconception intervention trial that we wanted to do funded. And so that's an assembly, it's an RCT, where we hypothesize within the context of future pregnancy in both rural and adolescent girls, that they'll respond to a collection of um, interventions to optimize BMI. So those girls that are slightly underweight, nudge them up a bit. And those that are overweight, nudge them down a bit. And this would obviously have benefit for themselves, but then reduce the risk for their offspring. And it's in a collaboration with Agincourt, Cambridge, and the Soweto team. So this is now funded. Um, we've got a whole set of questions which deals with not just the adolescent and the ability to reduce the variance in body mass index. Um, but also the engagement with health services, um, pregnancy, and, and indicators um, in the offspring. Um, this trial is powered both on the um, adolescent outcome, but also on a um, infant outcome. And so we can start seeing that 
if the preconception period with an intervention that hopefully has the effect, um, how does that translate um, across um, to the infant? And of course, is this affordable? So a big focus of the work with David was not just going with the ideal, but going in with the limitations with that South Africa has in terms of its health system and how to think pragmatically of what we could do uh, within those uh, resource constraints. And so just very briefly, just to give you in a sense, this is a complex intervention that deals with um, a primary health clinic model with community health workers. So using that kind of infrastructure that's already there, we are, are um, upscaling the community health workers to deal with this with, in, within this adolescent trial. And so they get a whole set of skill training. There's parental support. Um, that was a key element in terms of adolescent nutrition. Um, and as you can imagine, in South Africa, um, economics is a big barrier to trying to get behavior change and improve nutrition. So in this project, we have a conditional cash transfer to the house. We have other support around social grants. There's lit health literacy and aspects around parental support. And then the big focus around the adolescent. Health literacy is much, much lower in South Africa um, than um, appreciated. And so if you expect adults or adolescents to engage with health, um, that kind of effort of improving health literacy is, is vital. And so we have aspects of health literacy, behavior change, a multi-micronutrient supplement to deal with short-term anemia, but longer-term iron stalls, um, and also trying to offset a bit of inflammation. Um, connection to par um, primary health care, support management. Adolescents, there's complexity, there's HIV, other things than nutrition play an important role. And so one has to be able to bring those into account and deal with them in their own right, as well as trying to promote optimal um, um, nutrition. And of course, for adolescents that become pregnant, there's an additional support module. So this trial is now funded and we infield with our um, screening program at schools to identify the adolescent girls that will then be recruited into the trial. So this still has four years to go, um, but it is a culmination of many, many hours and discussions and perseverance um, to get to this point. And, and David kept us on that narrow path these years. And so for me, I'm most appreciative of the opportunity to have been mentored and to work with David as a as a colleague and, and build programs of work around many of the ideas that you've heard echo across what David's been doing, but now applied in a slightly different way within South Africa. Um, so immensely grateful for, um, for that and for the time to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you, Shane, for, for sharing that. And again, the, the themes coming through of, of David of, you know, one of collaboration across across continents, uh, persistence, just never giving up, always doing doing more to get funding. Um, and also, um, again, that theme of being a decade ahead of his time with many of his ideas. So thank you. Uh, Shane for that um, and it's great as well thinking about his legacy uh, to know that there's an ongoing collaboration with with your group and with Nick and Ken um, here in Cambridge thank you okay so without further ado it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker who's Dr Clive Petrie uh, senior research associate now at the Institute of Metabolic Science but for many years um, he was um uh, uh, one of the sort of key scientific members of the team uh, on, on level eight in David's group there. And I think it's fair to say that uh, Clive's uh, scientific, pr scientific prowess is second only to his loyalty to Bristol Rovers as a football club. So over to you, Clive. Excellent. You can't have a better start than mentioning Bristol Rovers, really. <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah. Maybe he's an Arsenal fan. Oh. <laughs> Did someone just say Arsenal? 
<laughs> okay, so I've been asked to talk about the Cambridge Baby Growth Study, and thank you for the organisers for inviting me. Um, David didn't actually start the Cambridge Baby Growth Study. It started as a European project when head of department of paediatrics at the time, uh, Yain Hughes, got a grant to look at the impact of the environment on reproductive development in boys. Um, so they started recruiting pregnant women, and this was before they knew the sex of the baby, and were discovering that a lot of potentially useful information was being lost because the women dared to have girls. <laughs> okay, now as you've heard, around in the year 2000, David and a number of others, including Ken, came over from Oxford to Cambridge, and uh, I joined David's team at the beginning of 2001. And at that time, David and Ken had a number of very interesting um, results, data relating to fetal and infant growth. And largely they got these using the ALSPAC cohort from Bristol. But David very much had the idea that he wanted his own cohort where there would be multiple measurements of growth and development during infancy and beyond lots of clinical samples taken so that various biomarkers could be measured and then related to the measures of growth and development. So Yian's project and David's idea will merge together as the Cambridge Baby Growth Study with uh, four key investigators, David, Ken, Yian and Carlo. Um, oh, sorry, I should get rid of that. Maybe I want to, uh, oh, good. Okay, now, uh, some years later, Philippa, who's in the audience, um, drew this diagram, showed um, that nearly, well, 2,200 women were uh, recruited into the study initially, although 571, unfortunately, withdrew prior to their birth, but that still left 1,600 that attended various uh, measurements as the babies grew, and this recruitment took place between 2001 and 2009. And there have been a number of other arms to this study added later on to increase the number of babies born small for gestational age, to increase the number of babies born to women with diabetes, and to increase the number of babies that were exclusively breastfed. Well, we heard earlier that David had something like 600 publications in peer-reviewed journals. Well, I want to say that about 50 of them came from the Baby Growth Study. So today, I'm gonna to highlight a few of them, um, not necessarily the best, not necessarily the key ones, but just to show the, the, the wide ranging nature of David's work with the Cambridge Baby Growth Study. And I'm gonna present it according to the different stages of life that have been looked at over the years. So the very first paper that I could find came out in 2008 in Diabetes Care, where Ken found that in women, pregnant women without diabetes, their insulin and glucose and body mass index contributed to birth outcomes. So their type of delivery and how, how fat the, the baby born was. So that was the very first paper. Now, David had insisted that oral glucose tolerance tests were done as part of um, the markup in the study. And that meant that we could look at gestational diabetes. So in collaboration um, with Albert Kuhlman, long-term friend of the Cambridge Baby Growth Study, we found four fatty acids that we could use, um, measure them in blood samples at the beginning of the second trimester of pregnancy to predict the development of gestational diabetes one trimester later. Um, having so much information collected about pregnancy and samples meant that we were ripe for collaboration, and that also occurred. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see a paper where we collaborated with Steve O'Reilly, who was very interested in a, a candidate protein called GDF15 that he considered may be involved in the causing hyperemesis gravidarum. And we, we were able to show in the Cambridge Baby Growth Study increased concentrations of this protein in women who reported vomiting in pregnancy and those that took antiemetics. And that was the first time that that had been shown. Now, David also insisted that we take samples from the mother, the father and the child 
um, for DNA extraction and genotyping. And this was great because it set us apart a little bit because we were able to look at individual allele transmission in polymorphisms in the imprinted genes that David was involved in. These are genes where, you know, all genes are, we inherit one copy from our mom, one copy from our dad. And generally speaking, both copies are turned on. But imprinted genes are one where one of those copies is turned off. Which one being turned off um, depends on the gene itself, the tissue in question, and the stage of development. And we were able to, to show that a gene called IGF2, which you've already heard about today a little bit, that was one of David's favorites, and where only the copy um, inherited from the father is active, were associated with maternal glucose concentrations in pregnancy. And what that meant was a potential mechanism whereby the dad's genes through the baby could affect maternal glucose concentrations and then the baby's size at birth. So blame it on the fathers. Now, other imprinted genes, we found similar results. There were associations with blood pressure um, and also associations with markers of insulin resistance and insulin secretion. So moving on to birth and a study by Philippa and Olga, who's also in the audience. Um, there was a, a bit of a temporal shift in offspring in babies born to women who had gestational diabetes. Um, and we don't know whether this was just in Cambridge or whether this happened further afield. But to begin with, in that first phase that I spoke about, um, offspring of women with gestational diabetes tended to be the typical macrosomic, you know, floppy babies, excess adiposity and so on. But, that, but as time went on um, in, in uh, later years, it was found that that had more or less completely disappeared. And this was a little bit strange. And um, it may be down to one change of consultant at the uh, gestational diabetes clinic, who, who was rather more um, uh, caring about trying to get tight glucose control. Um, okay, and also at birth, uh, more recently, we found that if the mothers took multiple mi micronutrient supplements, the baby was born with an increased birth weight and increased adiposity. And the specific nutrient that may be involved in this is iron, which is um, interesting in a country where, although iron is part of the multiple micronutrients that you can buy for, for pregnancy, um, it's not actually recommended, uh, you know, certainly in women that aren't um, anemic. So that was birth, then infancy, and you can see pictures of, of uh, one of the babies um, being measured with their, their skin folds measurement, their length, their head, circumference and so on. In another early paper, Ken found that IGF-1 concentrations at three months of age were able to uh, predict changes in body length and adiposity. And in a very important um, study for um, this side of the, of the baby growth study, Carlo presented the descriptive epidemiology of crypt orchidism, both congenital and acquired, and showed for the first time that acquired cryptorchidism was actually quite a common entity in male babies. And this was the first time that this had been um, described. And then some more studies with uh, fats. Philippa again, this time with, with, with Albert, uh, showed that short chain fatty acid composition um, in maternal breast milk, uh, another one of the clinical samples that were collected, was associated with adiposity in the infants. And also something that probably went a little bit under the radar was by measuring three lipid species, um, they were able to say with a reasonable degree of certainty whether a baby had been breastfed or bottle fed or even mixed fed and to the extent of that mixing. Now, that may not be that exciting, but if you have maybe some kind of historical cohort or something where this kind of information may now be seen as vital, but wasn't the data wasn't collected at that time, this may be something that's uh, extremely useful to know. Going back to um, the DNA samples, we more recently again looked at genotypes from HLA genes and, and related genes that give risk for type 1 diabetes and found changes in linear growth um, were associated with some of the polymorphisms and, and this was also associated with changes in IGF-1, which we've heard quite a lot about today. 
And then maybe possibly the, the, the strangest, um, but very interesting paper was done in, in a mini, mini study of boys aged about three and four in collaboration with Melissa Hines from uh, the psychology department who found that both prenatal um, androgen exposure measured by the anal genital distance um, at birth and the postnatal androgen exposure measured by penile growth increase in the first three months of life, uh, increased amounts of those were both um, associated with increased typical muscular play behavior, which, um, well, certainly different from most of the other studies we did, that's for sure. Okay, so from publishing in the Cambridge Baby Growth Study to publicizing it, and we tried to publicize it a number of ways. Um, I showed a front cover earlier of one of the newsletters that we did, but we had, you know, there were coffee mornings and there were celebrations. Um, in the top right, you can see David giving a lecture at a celebration of the 10th anniversary of the Baby Growth Study. Um, it was obvious amongst the people that David worked with that people liked him. And the reason I've shown some of the pictures of some of the participants on the left-hand side is that they're my kids. <laughs> and, that, and, and that is me as, as dad. And uh, sorry, from over here, even from the days where your son is not afraid to dress like his dad. <laughs> okay, so if you look at the, the baby there, he was the 1,000th uh, recruit to this study um, with, with the IM. And most recently, he has been recalled, and that's his picture. Uh, a few years ago, to the so-called is back again, <laughs> was recalled for the uh, Cambridge Baby Growth Outcome Study, looking at some of the originally recruited children aged about 10, and measures of growth and adiposity and blood pressure and glucose tolerance were taken um, in a number of the children, and the papers for that are just starting to come out. So um, Ken found that um, infancy measures of adiposity um, and length were able to predict, but only to a small extent, childhood obesity around that time. And in the most recent paper, um, we found that if mothers took iron supplementation during pregnancy, as I said earlier, they ended up with, with a somewhat larger baby. Well, that we found as we followed them up um, that kind of disappeared in infancy and certainly wasn't there around age 10. But what was there was a certainly not clinical and very small, but a statistical reduction in blood pressure in the children. And thinking this was a bit mad, I searched the literature and found out that um, the only other people that found this before were people in Alspac, which nicely draws us full circle if you like. Now, a lot of people have been involved in this study. Oh, I've totally lost the ability to, oh, ah, no, I've got to go back. Okay, yeah, okay. Right, so a lot of people have been involved in this study. A number of them are in the audience here, and I've tried to make a, a list really just to um, impress people of all the number of people and different roles of kind of people. Sorry if you're watching this and you felt you were part of it, but um, you know, I, I, I really tried to work hard at that. And the idea of this really is to show some of the legacy that David has left us in terms of the baby growth study and all the samples and all the data that there was. Indeed, even this week, I spent a good chunk of the week going through freezers, trying to sort samples for an ongoing collaborative uh, study. Um, so you can see the different groups of, of staff, the four investigators at the top, but the one group really that I should mention with particular praise for making the study the success that it has been are the nurses who between them that list probably um, worked something like 60 years on this, this study in total. So um, this is the last slide and it's a nice picture of the nurses with the investigators. Um, being the last live talk, I'm gonna go a bit off track now and say a couple of personal dedications to David, really. Firstly, as an advisor to me, because um, 
when I started working for him, I'd already had type one diabetes for about 20 years. Um, we heard earlier how <clears throat> certainly historically, you used to have to mix insulins and glass syringes. I've done all that. Uh, by the time I started working with David, I was using injection pens, but certainly, you know, there were times when there would be literally two injections at the same time and all this. And I was on standard human insulin. And there are a lot of, there were a lot of changes. There have been a lot of changes during this, this 20 years. And each one of them, I, I said to David, what do you think about this? Do you think this would be good? Do you think this would be bad? We've had analogs, um, you know, all this kind of thing. And uh, now I'm standing here. I have my insulin pump. David thought that was a good idea. I have my glucose. David thought that was a good idea. You know, so that, that was very personal. And that was great for me to have a world expert that I could just, you know, <laughs> you know, just sit outside his office and, you know, snigger when I hear the, the, the rude words when there were arguments with certain other, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> investigators and, you know, um, arguments with, with Carlo and glugs glug of coffee machines and, and, and this kind of thing. And the other thing really that I want to mention really was the, the loyalty from David towards me, because very early on when I started working for him, as, as a career postdoc, it's quite difficult um, maintaining a, a, a salary. And David said to me, he said, I've, I've done well with clinicians, he said, but not really with scientists. Now I'm a biochemist and um, I thought, well, it seems like a nice man though. Well, let's, let's just see how we go. And 20 years later, you know, I was still working for him. Okay, I may have had to have something like 25 contracts during that time, but at least they were continuous contracts. So um, I want to add loyalty to the list of um, characteristics that we're so proud of. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clive, for that uh, very, very lovely talk um, and for um, sharing your, your personal experience um, of, of David. Thank you. Over to you, Ken. Thank you, Clive. Um, you've heard that uh, David was uh, had many international collaborators, was had an international traveller. I have to say he particularly loved his trips to Africa both to, to, to Shane, but also to, to the Gambia. And uh, Jane has described, his, he was often excited by ideas, but he was particularly excited and just uh, buzzing the, 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 about the, the trip to, to, to the Gambia, um, going there and while he was there and, and afterwards. Um, I think particularly by the, 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 the setup there, the, the how the amazing research unit is embedded in the community of a, of a, of a village, looking side by side there. Uh, but also the, the, the fascinating idea of that the, the changes in nutrition um, in the different seasons in, in, the, in the Gambia had such marked effects and long lasting effects on, on health. And uh, yes, it was fascinated by this idea of uh, early life programming of health uh, by nutrition. Our next speaker, An Andrew Prentice, unfortunately sends his apologies because he's, uh, he's unwell. Matt, and to Andrew, and Andrew, do wish you all the best on your uh, recovery. Um, I should say that area um, used to be quite heated in previous days. I remember um, heated discussions between uh, David Dunger and David Barker about uh, the thrifty phenotype hypothesis, so-called Barker hypothesis, or the thrifty genotype hypothesis, so-called Neil hypothesis, after James Neil. And then I was reflecting there's never been a Dunga hypothesis, in the same way there's never been a Dunga syndrome. And I you know, wonder if this does uh, reflect uh, what Jane was saying, that he was never egoistic, he was never in it for the personal recognition or accolades, despite the many uh, prizes uh, that, that he got. And I think that was a great role model to, to many of us. And our last speaker in this uh, for, for, for the day is uh, Neil Dalton. Neil Dalton uh, is director of the Well Child Laboratories at the Evelina Hospital in London. 
and uh, professor of, of pediatric biochemistry at King's College Hospital, uh, King's College London. And you've heard about really sort of really diverse areas that David was uh, interested in. And um, Neil Dalton was involved, I think, in all of those, whether it was growth, uh, cohorts, type 1 diabetes, insulin resistance, trials. Neil Dalton was always in the working group, always in the, the committee. And if he wasn't there, there'd always be an action list for Neil to, to, to do afterwards. And David worked closely with Neil for many uh, decades, much longer than, than, uh, uh, than, than I did. And so it's great that uh, end the, the session with a, a talk recorded by Neil. Ladies, gentlemen, and colleagues, <clears throat> firstly, a humble thank you to the organizers of today's meeting for inviting me to talk about some of the work that over very many years, I had the privilege of working on with David. Secondly, apologies for not being at the meeting in person. So when I first met David, uh, the term biomarker had rarely been used, but biomarkers were critical to patient management. And the classic in paediatrics is the growth chart, which highlights the main uh, value of biomarkers in terms of uh, clinical diagnosis and management. You can look at, you can plot on a centile chart an individual patient to see where they sit with their peers. And that is useful to know whether they've got, uh, uh, they're on a low centile or a, a reasonable centile. Uh, but the more important observations are over time, where you have longitudinal data and can see, uh, in particular here of interest to David, is catch-up growth in this individual here. And obviously that uh, may happen naturally, but it could also be in response to clinical intervention. It can be monitored very carefully. The def single deficiency really is that there is no clue to mechanism. And this is true of many biomarkers. So at that time in 1987, when I did meet David, um, Harry Keane had been doing a lot of work on uh, urine albumin excretion in uh, patients with diabetes. And I've uh, uh, put this slide in primarily to show that the first use of the term microalbuminuria was it actually in Guy's hospital records uh, in 1969. What Harry and his group were able to show was that uh, the albumin excretion rate was increased in uh, diabetics compared to controls, but there was significant overlap, as we can see here. And as he uh, quite rightly uh, suggested, it did not in any way uh, tell him what was going on. He regarded that there must be some, either the hypoglycemia or some undefined diabetic process that caused the albuminuria. David's interest was really uh, as to whether this uh, might be useful in children with type 1 diabetes. Obviously, he would like to do a study where we could look at the prevalence of microalbuminuria, but the key was could it predict the future of uh, the development of future diabetic complications. And in order to do this properly, required longitudinal data and a longitudinal observation study, uh, which was ORPS. To do ORPS required some simplification. Measuring uh, excretion rates in children is virtually impossible. And characteristic, uh, or classically, we use the ratio to creatinine. And so the first thing that we were uh, charged with doing was really to compare albumin excretion rate and albumin creatinine ratio in uh, children, uh, whether with diabetes or not to show that there was in fact a very strong correlation and that we could use ACR in uh, that context. One of the other problems of uh, albumin creatinine ratio or albumin, uh, it's uh, urine albumin itself, is that there is significant biological variation. And in order to reduce that uh, required us or a decision was made to take three early morning urine samples. And I think that was critical to uh, the uh, very uh, valuable long-term outcomes that we were able to show for the data that we generated. 
cross-sectionally, the data was very comp in children was very comparable to that observed by uh, Harry Keane's group at Guy's, uh, with the diabetic shifted to the right of this graph in terms of uh, albumin creatinine ratio. But the key observations were the longitudinal observations showing uh, that the cumulative probability of microalbuminuria increased with age in the boys and girls with uh, type 1 diabetes. Coming in round about the point of adolescence, and most interestingly for David, uh, a difference between girls and boys, suggesting to him that there was some hormonal effect uh, going on here. But in order to do some sort of intervention trial, which was the long-term outcome of all these, uh, these studies, um, and I'm taking you to 2007, which is 20 years after uh, we first met. Uh, David uh, published, uh, or we published, a uh, Kaplan-Meier survival estimate for the risk of developing microalbuminuria in subjects aged over 16 years. Based on measuring albumin excretion uh, in the age 11 to 15 years, i.e. at the point of adolescence. And what was clear was that in terms of the highest tertile of urine albumin creatinine ratio uh, in that age group, 11 to 15 years, they had the highest risk, really quite significantly highest risk of developing microalbuminuria. And this uh, provided the uh, end point possibility for um, the ADIT trial. At the same time, we were working on other biomarkers, particularly in relation to glomerular filtration rate. And this study, which we did uh, relatively uh, early on in the ORPS study, in, in the ORPS children, showed that hyperfiltration was associated with those children who went on to develop microalbuminuria. And this really informative uh, Kaplan-Meier plot showed quite clearly that your risk of developing microalbuminuria was highly associated with a GFR of greater than 125 and an HbA1c of greater than 10%. But you need to be able to measure glomerular filtration rate easier. And we had come across another biomarker in our work um, in uh, the uh, children in the chronic renal failure clinic at, uh, at uh, the Evelina, which was symmetric dimethyl arginine. And this shows the initial validation study. And it was uh, applied within the uh, ORPS cohort. And this was one of the most informative slides showing the lower the SDMA, i.e. the more you were hyperfiltering the uh, um, the more likely you were to develop um, a decline in uh, renal function. And this is quite a significant uh, change here, uh, still probably within the normal range by uh, the mid twenties, but you could see that you were uh, uh, in a situation of decline if you had got uh, persistent microalbuminuria. Question then arises, what causes hyperfiltration? Well, we had significant evidence in terms of urine RBP and NAG, this showing the RBP cumulative probability. In, in other words, that on a, uh, over time, every patient who had type one diabetes, every child who had type one diabetes was likely to have developed an RBP urea at some stage. It was virtually always reversible. Um, which was uh, an important observation as well. And in clinical practice, we use uh, urine retinol binding protein as an indicator of um, uh, the ATP status of the proximal tubule. It's a very sensitive biomarker of ATP status within the proximal tubule. And we shouldn't have been surprised at that because if you go back uh, into the uh, 70s with Hans Krebs and George Alberti, they were able to show increased whole blood lactate pyruvate ratio in diabetes, i.e. there was increased tissue NADH, NAD ratio, um, meaning that in diabetes, you actually have perceived tissue anoxia. And what you, uh, the response to that, the physiological response to that is to provide more substrate, in this case, oxygen, i.e. increase uh, organ blood flow. And this happens not just in the kidney, 
but also in the liver. This is uh, hemoglobin A1C against ADMA. And in the early phases of disease in, in children, one can see that there is a negative correlation. So the higher the HbA1c, the more drive there was to, to, get, AD, uh, to get oxygen to the um, uh, uh, liver so that you could convert uh, ADMA to DMA and, and so on. And this is in uh, total contrast to what you see in the older patients, where in fact, the worse your uh, HbA1c, the higher your ADMA. It demonstrates really how important it is to in uh, the pediatrics is in understanding uh, the development of chronic diseases. And there are major chronic cardiovascular changes and stress involved in this increased organ blood flow. So what's the consequence for the kidney? Well, once your proximal uh, tubular energy limit for solute and low molecular weight protein reabsorption is exceeded, then tubular glomerular feedback kicks into place and you automatically reduce GFR. This happens uh, intrinsically and is the problem uh, of chronic renal failure in that it is inexorable, even though the original cause of the disease may apparently have gone away. And what you're seeing, and I show this slide again because it is so important, that you move from hyperfiltration to end-stage renal disease because here you, your proximal tubule cannot cope with the amount of solute that you are filtering, and so it starts to shut down, and it is inexorable unless you treat. And in the early days, in terms of uh, uh, chronic renal failure, children with chronic renal failure, we reduce the filtered load primarily. Uh, by reducing protein intake, but also by reducing phosphate intake uh, and eventually uh, moving to uh, phosphate binders. Of course, these days one can use the reabsorptive mechanism by using uh, uh, glucose uh, reuptake inhibitors. And data is already there showing that you can slow the, the rate of decline in renal function. How does that relate or perceived tissue anoxia relate to albumin creatinine ratio. Well, as soon as you have uh, tissue anoxia or an increase in uh, that NADH, NAD ratio, then you will get increased apoptosis and increased release of en lysosomal enzymes, including the sulfatases and neuraminidases, which are extremely toxic to the glycocalyx. They strip off the uh, endothelial negative charge and Albumin is positively charged, and as a consequence, it uh, uh, leaks uh, in the glomerulus into the urine. But this is happening systemically. It's happening uh, throughout the uh, endothelium. We looked at potential biomarkers that might help us to uh, get some credibility for the uh, mechanism. And uh, one that we have used and, and uh, validated is uh, plasma n glucose aminidase activity, not urine, the plasma, showing the amount of lysosomal enzyme release, which is significantly increased in uh, the children with type 1 diabetes. Also free neuraminic acid as an indicator of neuraminidase activity, and again it is increased, and Syndican 1, which is a, a biomarker of upregulation of glycocalyx repair. And at this stage, not only are we starting to understand the mechanism, but there is more data coming on board to show just how important the albumin creatinine ratio is in terms of uh, all cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. Uh, the red lines are the patients with diabetes, the, patient, the blue lines are in the general population. And this was a huge study uh, put together by the, uh, from the N. Haynes um, uh, study and uh, by the Chronic uh, Kidney Disease Prognosis Consortium. And their argument, their uh, perception was that this was a fantastic biomarker and was largely being ignored in clinical practice. At that time, as I said, there was huge interest in finding other biomarkers, uh, even though uh, David and I felt that we had a fantastic biomarker in ACR. And we got involved with uh, the summit uh, study, looking at 
uh, biomar looking for biomarkers predictive of bio diabetic nephropathy and rapid decline in, in GFR and in various JDRS studies, including ones where we measured in the urine uh, to look at the uh, um, uh, proteins and metabolites that uh, were there. I show these two slides for one simple purpose, to point out that even though you measure an awful lot of components, they tend to be clustered. And in terms of the plasma, the majority are markers of uh, plasma markers of glomerular filtration rate. And as you would expect, they are negatively correlated with EGFR, shown in the red. But it's the cluster phenomena. And if you look in the urine, there are literally thousands of proteins that one can measure, but they are acidic proteins or they're low molecular weight proteins, but these are the acidic proteins. And because it's there in the highest concentration in plasma, this albumin is by far the easiest one to use. However, they were useful studies to do because they did emphasize that uh, if you wanted to predict diabetic nephropathy and rapid decline in GFR, and you wanted to do it in plasma, then it was uh, measures of GFR that you would do it in. And interestingly, there was a clear dichotomy between the children and uh, the adults in that in the children, because we were looking so early in the disease process, it was hyperfiltration that we were looking at, i.e. the lower the plasma GFR biomarker, whereas in the older patients, what we were looking at was essentially that inexorable decline once they're in end stage uh, in uh, CKD uh, to end stage renal disease. Partningly in the urine, albumin creatinine ratio came out as the most sensitive and early biomarker of endothelial damage, enabling risk prediction for the development of diabetic nephropathy and all other diabetic complications. And we use this within the ADIT trial to look at the effect of an ACE inhibitor or a statin, and you can see that we picked up the effect of the ACE inhibitor in terms of reducing the cumulative probability of developing microalbuminuria. And that was published in uh, the New England Journal in 2017. So David, more than 30 years ago, had an inspired perception of the potential of ACR in uh, children with type one diabetes. That has gone on to really explain uh, the phenomenon for the phenomenon in adult patients. ACR is a unique biomarker. It is the earliest indicator of uh, diabetic complications. It allows accurate monitoring of disease progression, accurate monitoring of therapeutic intervention, and it signposted the mechanism that underlies diabetic complications. Thank you, David. So, uh, muted, yeah. Um, thank you to Neil. I think, uh, I think Warren would agree that uh, identifying good biomarkers, whether predictive biomarkers or functional biomarkers remains a, a key research challenge. And um, so that the partnership with, uh, with, with, with Neil Dalton over 30 years or more was a really, a uh, powerful aspect of David's research, and I said across not just type one diabetes, but all um, many different aspects um, of, of his research interests. So that brings us uh, now to the end of the, the day. Before I say some concluding words, just some thanks and, uh, um, and practical aspects. Thank you to all those online who've uh, put up with the couple of technical glitches along the way. Um, the online meeting will remain open for a while, so allow you to do, do uh, contribute any written chats to paste them on, on the chat function. As I said, we will um, collate those um, at the end of the meeting. Uh, I want to say to you, well, the prime thing I wanted to say was a big thank you. Um, a big thank you to Jane and to Vicky and to you all um, for speaking. Malcolm drove four and a half hours here to get here uh, and presumably four and a half hours back um, for you all for speaking and particularly, of course, to Ken. Um, 
of whom David was very, very fond. Just one other thing I wanted to add was, you know, speaking from a family point of view, Jack is here, Daisy will see this, Peter, I think, is still online. How helpful, I know that wasn't its purpose, but how helpful and comforting I think it is for us to get that real longitudinal perspective from a variety of different voices and uh, kind of uh, how how David was the one thing I just wanted to add is how modest he was and it's important to say that because at his funeral which you can imagine was a strange time an important time there were many of our non-medical friends who were there they had absolutely no idea of how eminent he was in his field, no idea at all. All they knew was he was a pediatrician, and they were astonished to hear at the funeral from Ken, primarily, of how much he had done. And um, the only time I want to leave you with one story, which Jack will know, I'm afraid, and he probably will remember better than I, because I wasn't there at the time. I just heard it at the time, a very traumatic time, and then we laughed about it. So. Um, I never heard him, he described himself as a paediatrician, generally. He never talked about being a professor of paediatrics, let alone all the prizes that he had, he had got. The only time I heard him own up to that was when Jack was very sick, iatrogenically mainly, at UCLH, who made a very good job of trying to kill him um, uh, at the age of 15. Uh, and uh, actually, I, I heard, I think Stella told me how, how David had cancelled all his engagements at the time, highly unusual thing for him to do as you would appreciate uh, and essentially I won't go into the gory detail I could regale you with it he had a simple appendicitis correctly diagnosed by the GP and subsequently completely screwed up by UCLH uh, perforated had every complication uh, pulmonary edema uh, abdominal abscesses the whole caboodle uh, and then finally uh, abdominal obstruction in the middle of the night David was with him at UCLH Jack was howling the ward down, such they had to move all the other children uh, away because he was disturbing their sleep. And not, I've had a dumb obstruction, believe you me, it really, really hurts. It's worse than labour, except you don't get a baby at the end of it. And uh, they called some hapless registrar in, who was clearly dithering. Uh, and at the one point, they thought that Jack had intersusception. So trying his best, the surgical registrar was trying to explain to David what an intersusception was. And what he was describing, he talked about, about rabbits in gloves and at which point David just lost it he said I'm a professor of pediatrics get a plain abdominal x-ray now accordingly they did uh, and Hello, that was the only news. time I ever ever heard him claim to be a professor Hello, I, news. I leave you with that and his modesty but thank you thank, thank you. you okay that, that those last words thank you all and uh, thank you, David. Thank you.